listen to his person. Okay. Good morning, Vietnam. Good morning. Thank you for thank you for coming. Uh, we have a very very busy day, and we 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 are willing to stick as much as possible to the to the not only to the agenda but also to the timetable. And well, I'm Tomas Garcia Scalate. I'm now deputy director of uh, the Institute for Economy, Geography, and Demography of the Spanish uh, Research Center. Uh, in previous life, have been several things uh, before. Uh, and uh, I, I am in charge uh, to be your moderator. It, it's funny that now I become moderator when I've been agitator all my life long. <laughs> well, uh, I, I thank really Pan for, for this initiative, for bringing us together for this quite important issue. And uh, if you allow me, I will, I will share with you in this very short introduction. Slower. Ah, you don't leave. Okay. Ah. okay. Ah. It's better now? Okay. Mes excuses. À la cabine française. I I I just want to to share with you some some of the of the questions I have today and I I I would like I would hope I hope that uh, I, I will have some pieces of answers during, during this morning, thanks to the, the high level of, uh, of uh, speakers and participants and so on. The first one, well, we, we know it since yesterday, the New Green Deal. Well, I've read in, 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 the, in, the, in, uh, in Twitter and so on, the, the, green, the New Green Deal or the New Green No Deal or some, the no green deal and so on. Well, the new green deal is, is it's a good news. It's a first step. It's a, a, a deep end. Mm -hmm. I think it's an issue which I'm sure I will I, I would like the different speakers and and inter start uh, thinking integrating the new green deal in in their in their thinking. And obviously, uh, my main uh, definition, I'm, I'm a capper, it means uh, cap-oriented uh, guy. Uh, cap, uh, the new cap is in discussion. Uh, how to manage it? One issue is to reinforce conditionality. What does this mean? As far, for instance, as pesticides directive is concerned, uh, there is a discussion now in the Council about the nutrient balance. Is it a real issue for conditionality or for something else? How to make use of this reinforce conditionality in order to advance in, in the process of a more sustainable uh, farming system on the F2F, to F to F, farm to fork strategy? The new cap. Uh, we speak about a strategic plan. What can we do inside the strategic plan? How to ensure the strategic plan are delivering at the member state level, at the European level, and here the Parliament will have a, uh, an important role. Uh, on, on, uh, on the new cab, we have also the eco scheme. Uh, rotation as conditionality or rotation as eco scheme. Uh, rotation with leguminous, without leguminous, what does this mean? Uh, extensive livestock has to be supported, but what is extensive livestock? And so on, well, a, a lot of issues which, 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 are, which are there. Uh, the new cap is also uh, putting in the center the farm advisory service. The, the change in the way the farm system is working cannot be done against the farmer, has to be done with the farmer. And in order to be done with the farmer, they obviously need to make their living, but they also need to be supported with technical advice and, and, and so on. This, this farm advisory service, uh, what happened with him, which role and so on, how really, uh, uh, how really uh, succeed to make it an important element uh, for uh, 
for this uh, technological change and, 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 and so on. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the, the issue of risk management insurance and so on, it's clear that if you are innovating, you are taking risks. Is there a way to manage those new risk, additional risk, in, in, in a way through some kind of public intervention? Well, I, I don't know. It, it's open. <laughs> it's really open questions that I have in, in mind uh, and that I would like, uh, I would love if at the end I, I, I can have taken notes with some pieces of answer or fresh thinking on, on them. I, I know we'll not resolve everything, but I think it's, it's a clear, important moment. The new grid deal starting, the farm to force strategy building, mm -hmm. The, the new cap in discussion, it's a real, real historical moment and I would like to, to end thanking uh, the Pesticide Action Network for this initiative and, and your group and you for the uh, generosity you have demonstrated in, uh, in uh, sharing, in allowing, in uh, covering this, uh, this, uh, this initiative. Well, I think despite the fact that we have started late we are we are we are on time. Uh, do you want to 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 say something? It's not foreseen in the agenda I have, but do you want to say something? Will you be able to stay with us all the morning? I I might I might need to run away for a short moment, but most of the time here, which is yes, we can. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, in the in the in the agenda now, we give the floor to. No, actually me. Ah, to you? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And so I am puzzled. <laughs> Martin, sorry. Okay. I give the floor to you then. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, first of all. Uh, it's, my, it's my honor to, wel to welcome you here uh, today. And uh, I have to say, I was a bit. It's torn about the data, especially I was concerned uh, since uh, the uh, timing is tricky for, for me and my colleagues because it's just 24 hours since the Green Deal and everybody's uh, crazily busy and the uh, number of the people are in Madrid. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a, it's a good timing, um, logistically challenging, but good timing because it's something really fresh that we can discuss something really fresh that we can reflect on and something and and the green deal is something that we should utilize to advance what we're doing and uh, i would like to especially thanks to the farmers that made it uh, because i think what is often forgotten is that in the whole battle around the pesticides and the chemicals used in agriculture um, farmers play a key role um, ultimately it's you who are those who need to turn uh, the change into reality and uh, we need to do the change with you because it's something that uh, it's ultimately about providing not just food but also livelihoods and i think this is something this is the area where the dialogue and the cooperation are really really key not to mention the experience that you bring the last legislative term uh, where I wasn't around uh, was uh, interesting because it brought quite a bit of a progress from the parliament side, uh, certainly uh, not as much as from commission, but I think that's with the Green Deal that's going to change. And just to name the few things, I think the PEST committee has been really important uh, and it's a really good example for that pushing for mandatory production targets uh, on the European level, on the pesticides use, uh, pushing for more accountability and transparency uh, in decision-making of the famous COPAF, uh, but also calling for a stronger protection of European farmers and consumers. So I think the Parliament did quite a bit of work, uh, but now uh, we need more political support and we need to continue the pressure to translate these calls and translate the, the latest evidence uh, into concrete action. What we see and what we've seen yesterday in the Green Deal was uh, a bit mixed uh, in terms of lack of concrete percentages, lack of concrete targets. Uh, 
in the same time, I would kind of still not be overly pessimistic about it because this is something which we will have to still negotiate and we'll have to fight for, uh, not just within the parliament, but also making sure that the member states are backing it because that's something which is often forgotten in the European context, that a lot of it depends on what the member states are willing to support. We don't have the worst pesticide legislation. Sometimes it, it makes me, you know, the Kevin coming back and uh, coming into the parliament and ob doing another objection on the uh, group approval of pest number of pesticides, including a number of hazardous ones, makes me feel like things are not good. But uh, actually, we have one of the better regulatory systems in the, in, in the world. Uh, we, by seeing the shortcomings and trying to address them, we're not saying that everything is really horrible and, you know, everything needs to be scrapped. But I think it's also uh, more optimistic of uh, we have still a space to improve. So let's not kind of forget uh, that we can be better and let's try to strive on this as a continuous improvement. Because as no legislation, uh, even the, our one is not bulletproof, and there are problems that need to be addressed. But what we have, and one of those problems is that uh, in the current regime, the Commission is actually forced to keep hazardous uh, chemicals on the market, to keep uh, the pesticides in the circulation, and we object then, but it's still out there because the uh, assessments are not completed uh, and are stuck, and it's, it, it can be almost described as a tactics uh, to not complete some of the assessments to keep the uh, hazardous pesticides, where it's already known that uh, with some of them they have they represent the problem on the market because there is no completed assessment. So I think that there is uh, a lot of expectation, at least from me, uh, towards the Commission and. Uh, I can say that what I want to try to push during the mandate is that, first of all, we really start moving ahead on getting rid of the uh, pesticides that are uh, candidates for the substitution, that are hazardous, and uh, we know that they trigger the thresholds and they trigger the main uh, criteria where they need to go out. What we also need to work better on is the protection of vulnerable groups. Uh, it's something where children, uh, women, especially the pregnant ones or breastfeeding ones, because it's again uh, very close linked to, development, uh, to the development of the child, uh, are in a particular sensitive group. And that's something where we need to pay a special attention uh, because uh, the early age of a child is uh, the one that ultimately can determine the, the whole life in terms of a health, for example, neural development. Uh, the, what we also need to do better is the, uh, better integrate the concerns around pesticides and the sustainable use of pesticides directive within the new common agriculture policy. I think the cap will be uh, reopened. Uh, fully on the Parliament's uh, level, and that's going to be one of the, the big fights of the spring. And there, what we really need to see is that the CAP is not just a way of handing out money. The CAP should serve a function, and I think, for me, the function is helping to protect uh, the health and environment, and helping farmers to do that. It means that we should encourage farmers, we should reward farmers who really take up agroecological practices, which, who use nature-based solutions. Uh, we should support more those farms which help to protect environment and biodiversity, those who have long-term objective and public health and sustainability at heart, and not the bad and irresponsible behavior, or just any behavior, you know, the kind of the classical uh, support on uh, just based on the amount of land it doesn't reflect anything you can do it's kind of, I do something on a, on a piece of land that amounts to agricultural practice and that's not in line with what 
I believe the common agricultural policy should achieve. So I'm glad that we managed to do some victories, uh, even very recently, even before the cap was reopened. Uh, and one particular one from, I think it was back in last week, and this is how the time starts slipping and kind of you lose the track of the weeks. But I think it was last week with then the uh, chlorpyrifos and uh, chlorpyrifos methylware band, which was definitely good news. Uh, and I hope to see more news on hazardous uh, pesticides and those which clearly meet the threshold criteria to follow. I think and I hope that this is not the last time that we sit together and that the cooperation and discussions uh, will continue because when we talk about how we can bring the best for the European farmers and the European environment and health, we can actually achieve much more. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear your ideas. I'm looking forward to see uh, the latest evidence from the ground, but also from on the ground, but also from science. Now, I would like to give the floor. That's, I don't like to talk much, and I'm looking at the time and the schedule. And I think we are good because that's brilliant. Because actually, we'll have time more to discuss things rather than listening to a political speeches. Uh, so let me give floor to Florence Jacket. Uh, I'm the Honourable Host and Research Director of the French National Research Agency to present us examples of policy and technical tools offered in France for the ecological transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's sure that it's better to speak that I speak in French rather than that someone is obliged to translate my bad English in French into French. Anglais dans... Cette langue. Donc du coup, je vais vous parler. Donc je suis Florence Jacquet, je suis euh, euh, économiste à l'INRA et je suis en ce moment en charge d'un programme, d'un nouveau programme de recherche lancé par le ministère de la Recherche sur euh, euh, des alternatives aux pesticides. Donc je vais vous parler notamment de ce programme. Je vais le mettre dans un contexte euh, de ce qu'est actuellement l'évolution donc des politiques en général et des politiques de recherche sur ces questions-là en France. Donc, euh, merci de m'avoir invité. Je suis contente d'être là pour discuter de toutes ces questions avec vous. Du coup, euh, la première chose, c'est de faire un petit retour en arrière sur ce qui s'est passé en France en termes de, de politique de réduction des pesticides euh, ces dix dernières années. Donc, l'histoire a commencé, enfin, en tout cas, s'est amplifiée en 2007 à l'occasion d'une réflexion qui s'est menée sous, à ce moment-là, la présidence de, de Nicolas Sarkozy autour des questions d'environnement, et c'est ce qu'on a appelé le grenelle de l'environnement. Lors de ces discussions concernant les pesticides, un objectif a été posé de réduire de, de moitié l'utilisation des pesticides en 10 ans. Donc à ce moment-là, avec quelques collègues, j'ai été impliquée dans un travail qui a été confié à l'INRA euh, pour savoir si c'était faisable ou pas d'atteindre cet objectif. Et, et ben, maintenant, aujourd'hui, dix ans après, où les résultats ne sont pas tout à fait ceux-là, hein, on n'a pas diminué les, les pesticides de 50%, je vais y revenir, je m'interroge, est-ce qu'on est qu s'est trompé dans ce qu'on a dit à l'époque, puisqu'on a dit que oui, c'était possible, ce n'était pas facile, mais c'était possible, et donc ce je, n'est je, pas inintéressant de se redemander ce qu'on a... Ce ce à quoi on est passé à côté. Enfin, ce pourquoi, ce que l'on a dit à cette époque-là, donc ça a été une, un travail d'expertise collective avec des agronomes et des, économi des économistes notamment. Donc les agronomes ont fait l'état des lieux, des solutions qui existaient alors et ont montré que, euh, euh, en gros, on pouvait diminuer les pesticides de 30% en mobilisant toutes les alternatives possible, disponible à l'époque euh, et qu'il fallait certainement, surtout si on voulait aller plus loin, jusqu'à 50%, euh, une reconception profonde des systèmes de culture. C'était donc beaucoup plus compliqué d'atteindre cette réduction, mais ce n'était pas totalement impossible. Du point de vue de l'analyse économique qui a accompagné cette réflexion, euh, on a travaillé en fait 
sur, par exemple sur les grandes cultures, sur, les, sur ce qu'avaient été les prix euh, des années précédentes, jusqu'en 2006 en gros, euh, et on disait que oui, à, compte tenu des prix, les, 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 les impacts sur euh, les revenus des agriculteurs de ces changements de système, qui dans certains cas pouvaient impliquer une toute petite baisse de rendement, ou en tout cas un risque de baisse de rendement, euh, étaient pas, étaient, les impacts étaient neutres, voire euh, voilà, n'étaient pas, pas négatifs en tout cas. En revanche, pour aller plus loin, pour réduire de 50% euh, des mesures de politique publique devraient être prises à la fois pour compenser les revenus ou si on veut dire à l'inverse pour inciter les agriculteurs à faire ce changement. Qu'est-ce qui a été mis en place du coup à la suite de ce grenelle de, de l'environnement C'est un plan, c'est une politique publique, donc ce qu'on appelle le plan Ecofito, euh, qui comprend beaucoup de volets, donc je ne vais pas rentrer dans les détails de tout ce que contient ce plan. Il y a un gros budget, 40 millions d'euros par an, qui est attribué au plan et ça va depuis des dispositifs de, 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 de suivi, d'observation de, de, à la fois des, de l'impact des pesticides. Donc ça comprend des mesures sur la qualité, la qualité des eaux et toute une série de choses comme ça. Ce qui nous intéresse peut-être plus ici pour la discussion, c'est deux choses qui sont importantes dans le plan, qui sont d'une part une politique de financement de la recherche et de l'innovation dédiée à la réduction de l'usage des pesticides et d'autre part un dispositif de ferme, euh, d'un réseau de fermes de, de démonstration et également un réseau d'expérimentation. Donc il euh, y, y a ce que l'on appelle le, le programme Défi qui... Euh, qui rassemble les résultats que l'on peut obtenir de ces fermes de démonstration et de ces réseaux d'expérimentation. Ceci étant dit, si, malheureusement, si on regarde l'impact global avec des indicateurs qui sont des indicateurs de suivi du plan Ecofito et qui sont donc des indicateurs de mesure au niveau agrégé des quantités de pesticides utilisés, ça c'est le graphique euh, de gauche, ou bien... Euh, avec des enquêtes plus spécifiques euh, au niveau des parcelles d'un certain nombre de cultures. Donc ça, c'est aussi un dispositif d'enquête du ministère de l'Agriculture qui a été mis en place pour suivre justement ce qu'il en était de l'utilisation des pesticides. Donc avec cet indicateur qui s'appelle l'indicateur, l'indice de fré fréquence des traitements, euh, la même chose en anglais. Et, 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 et qui montre que en fait, les quantités de pesticides n'ont pas diminué, elles ont même plutôt augmenté sur, les, sur la période. Donc euh, se pose la question du coup forcément de qu'est-ce qui s'est passé, pourquoi on en est là, malgré la, la volonté politique affichée, malgré les moyens mis en place à la fois dans, les, dans la recherche, dans les démonstrations, dans les instituts techniques également donc il y a plusieurs hypothèses qui sont certainement, qui sont certainement toutes à prendre en considération. D'un côté, il y a l'hypothèse économique, les prix, euh, les, si on compare les prix des grandes cultures, et des, des, des céréales et des oléagineux, on compare en bleu et en jaune, là, et en noir, c'est la tendance, l'indice de prix des pesticides. On constate qu'il n'y a pas d'incitation économique à la désintensification, si on peut dire. On a, à partir des années 2006-2007, des hausses des prix des céréales et des oléagineux qui n'encouragent pas à aller euh, diminuer les pesticides en, en, compte tenu de, 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 ces, de, de ces rapports de prix défavorables. La deuxième, le deuxième ensemble d'hypothèses pour comprendre ce qui se passe et pourquoi est-ce qu'on ne réduit pas les pesticides comme on voudrait, c'est ce que l'on appelle le verrouillage sociotechnique. Et donc, c'est la question de la difficulté qu'ont les agents économiques, aussi bien les agriculteurs que les entreprises d'amont et d'aval de l'agriculture, à sortir d'un système dans lequel ils sont engagés et par rapport auquel la totalité du système devrait changer simultanément afin de pouvoir aller dans le bon sens et, 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 et c'est ce qui ne se passe pas et c'est ça qu'on appelle ce verrouillage sociotechnique. Et puis la troisième famille d'hypothèses, c'est celle qui porte sur l'existence ou non d'alternatives. Est-ce qu'il y a des solutions 
Est-ce que la recherche fait bien son travail ou, ou, ou pas Donc, quelques une illustration de certaines de ces choses que je viens de dire là. Donc, si on regarde en France ce qui se passe et ce qui continue à se passer en termes de simplification des systèmes de culture, eh bien, on constate que... Euh, ils se sont, au cours des années passées, cette simplification s'est poursuivie, s'est renforcée, avec euh, une augmentation des surfaces des cultures arables au détriment de la polyculture élevage et une augmentation des rotations courtes, euh, avec deux ou trois cultures seulement, colza blé ou colza blé orge. C'est ces rotations courtes qui sont euh, représentées dans leur évolution sur cette carte de France qui est ici à l'écran. On a dans les indicateurs d'évolution des structures d'exploitation aussi un certain nombre d'éléments d'explication ou en tout cas de compréhension d'un phénomène qui, qui, qui est lié à ce que sont les exploitations aujourd'hui. Alors le graphique en haut à droite, il est très classique. Hein, C'est la diminution du nombre d'exploitations et l'augmentation des surfaces par exploitation. Les deux graphiques en bas, en bas ils illustrent autre chose, ils illustrent la tendance à un changement dans les structures d'exploitation avec en, en, en particulier une évolution du travail salarié extérieur ou du recours aux entreprises de travaux agricoles. Et euh, ça, c'est le graphique euh, en bas, là. Et l'autre euh, montre que si simultanément les, le nombre de... de pardon, la... Le travail familial, d'une part, et le travail salarié, d'autre part, au, dans les exploitations agricoles, diminue. La proportion de travail salarié par rapport au travail familial, à partir des années 90, s'inverse. Enfin, change en tout cas. La tendance change. On y a de plus en plus de travail salarié euh, en proportion donc, du travail total des exploitations agricoles. Et c'est aussi cette, ce phénomène-là qui, qui, qui est... Qui est, qui est, qui est qui est concomitant avec l'agrandissement des surfaces et la simplification des systèmes. Euh, bon, mais il y a quand même des choses positives qui se passent, qui ne sont d'ailleurs pas toutes sur ce graphique-là, mais il y en a quelques-unes sur ce graphique-là, qui sont euh, l'augmentation des superficies et des nombres d'exploitations en agriculture biologique, qui est, dont la tendance est extrêmement euh, forte, qu'on voit sur ce graphique, et où euh, on est actuellement, je pense, à, à, à 7% ou 7 ou 8% des surfaces et 9% des exploitations en bio en France. Ce n'est pas tant le chiffre qui est intéressant que euh, l'évolution qui, euh, qui continue à, à suivre une, une courbe ascendante. Les dans, les dans les fermes défis dont je vous ai parlé tout à l'heure, les, rés les résultats en termes de diminution de pesticides sont là. En tout cas, si on les compare avec l'augmentation que l'on observe en moyenne, il euh, y en a. Elles sont cependant très différentes selon les secteurs, avec, euh, l'on voit, une baisse beaucoup plus faible, finalement, pour les grandes cultures, qui sont tout de même euh, le principal secteur d'utilisation des pesticides en France. En bas à gauche, c'est juste un petit graphique sur les financements de la recherche qui ont été attribués par le plan Ecofito, par d'autres sources de financement, et qui euh, illustrent le fait que s'il y a eu des financements importants sur toutes ces périodes, on peut espérer qu'on a maintenant de plus en plus de résultats de la recherche qui peuvent être mobilisés par l'industrie pour produire des solutions alternatives ou par, ou par les, les services de, de conseil agricole pour aider les agriculteurs. Voilà ce que je voulais dire sur le passé. Alors où est-ce qu'on en est maintenant et qu est -ce qui, qu est -ce qui est les, quels sont les, 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 les points en discussion Alors, la pression sociale... La pression sociale est très forte en France sur ces questions des pesticides. C'est un sujet brûlant. Donc là, quelques graphiques qui montrent que quand on interroge les Françaises sur ce qu'ils en pensent, la grande majorité considère qu'on ferait mieux de, de, de s'en passer. Sur le glyphosate, 81% des gens pensent qu'il faut l'interdire. Euh, vous avez eu la question des des décrets qui ont été pris par un certain nombre de maires en France sur l'interdiction de pesticides au voisinage des habitations pour lesquelles il y a un gros soutien de la population. Quand on demande aux Français ce qui les inquiète le plus en termes de risques perçus qui viennent de l'extérieur en gros sur leur vie, les pesticides arrivent à troisième position après le cancer et le terrorisme. Le... Le... Qu -ce... Maintenant, qu'est-ce qui se passe en termes de politique publique Donc, 
depuis euh, cette année, on a un nouveau plan Ecofito qui s'appelle Ecofito 2+. Donc l'idée est de continuer le, le, le mouvement en renforçant, en analysant ce qui n'a pas marché dans le plan précédent et en créant de nouvelles euh, incitations. Donc le budget a été augmenté, les objectifs ont été révisés, donc euh, ils sont toujours là, affichés, avec un moins 25% en 2020. Je ne vois pas comment on pourra l'atteindre, parce qu'on y est déjà, mais on a un moins 50% en 2025. En tout cas, ça donne un cap. Euh, les réseaux de fermes expérimentales ont été euh, amplifiés. Donc l'objectif, c'est de, de... On a 3 000 fermes actuellement qui sont concernées, c'est de passer à 30 000. Et euh, dans les réseaux expérimentaux, on voit beaucoup plus qu'auparavant des, des expérimentations des, des, des expérimentations à zéro pesticide de plus long terme. Euh, on a créé un instrument euh, de, comme, à la, selon l'esprit des certificats d'économie d'énergie, un, un, un cert, des certificats d'économie de, de pesticides qui sont euh, attribués aux distributeurs et qui, qui doivent mettre en place des pratiques pour diminuer l'utilisation la, la, de pesticides. De la, on, enfin, on a renforcé les, les, les financements à la recherche. Et puis le dernier point euh, qui est pas sans effet, euh, c'est le plan de sortie du glyphosate qui, euh, qui, est, qui, est, qui est annoncé. <coughs> euh, alors, c'est ce programme dont je m'occupe en ce moment qui est un élément important, je crois, dans la, dans la politique de la recherche en France euh, aujourd'hui, qui a été décidé l'année dernière et sur lequel on a quand même pris du temps afin d'élaborer un agenda scientifique pertinent. Donc l'idée, la, la décision de l'année dernière, ça a été d'allouer de, de, 30 millions d'euros sur des, sur des projets de recherche euh, vraiment permettant véritablement de trouver des, sortes, des solutions pour sortir l'agriculture des pesticides. Donc c'est un programme de long terme. En tout cas, les projets qui vont être financés sont plus longs que ce que l'on a l'habitude de financer, soit au niveau... Euh, Horizon 2020, soit au niveau de la NR en France, de recherche. Et, et l'idée a été de dire, bon, on a déjà beaucoup de choses pour euh, mobiliser les solutions existantes, essayer de les assembler. Et, 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 et là, il faut aller plus loin, plus, peut-être euh, en s'autorisant à explorer des fronts de science un peu plus euh, ambitieux même si les résultats ne sont pas pour tout de suite, si on veut véritablement pré préparer des solutions pour sortir vraiment des pesticides, non pas l'an prochain, parce que ça, ça ne sera pas possible, mais en 2030 ou en 2040. Donc, donnons du temps à la recherche, ne demandons-lui demandons pas des résultats pour tout de suite, donnons du temps à la recherche pour qu'elle explore vraiment des pistes qui sont porteuses de solutions en rupture. Donc, ça a été ça, en gros, le parti pris de ce que l'on a de ce qui est en cours de, de, de réalisation dans ce programme. Et donc, en termes de thématiques, ça, 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 ça couvre un certain nombre de, 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 de thématiques qui sont à considérer souvent ensemble et qui sont à la fois des thématiques de recherche fondamentales, comme par exemple les questions d'interaction plante-plante ou plante-micro-organisme, les questions du microbiome des plantes, l'ensemble des micro-organismes qui intervient dans la régulation de la santé des plantes. Ça, c'est des fronts de science pour lesquels, sur lesquels on pense qu'il est important de, de mettre davantage d'efforts dans une optique de préparer le futur. Avec également une, des travaux en, en génétique ou en amélioration des plantes où on change la manière de penser et où on va regarder justement, non pas la plante toute seule, non pas la plante toute seule dans un environnement en facteur non limitant, mais la plante dans ses interactions avec les autres plantes ou avec les micro-organismes ou avec différents stress comme celui du climat. Et c'est cette euh, adaptation à ces caractéristiques-là qu'il faut travailler et, 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 et également euh, travailler davantage sur la diversité des cultures, à la fois euh, au niveau euh, de l'amélioration des plantes, mais aussi au niveau... De, de, de la compréhension donc de ces associations d'espèces ou de cultures ou d'activités et, euh, et leur déploiement euh, au niveau agronomique, donc leur, les conditions de leur développement 
au niveau agronomique, mais également ce que ça peut impliquer en termes de, de type de machine qu'il faudrait mettre au point, le rôle du numérique par rapport à ça. Et, 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 enfin, et, et enfin, la question de l'ensemble des déterminants socio-économiques de cette transition, donc par rapport à cette diversification par exemple, ça ne peut se faire que si, que si on, les stratégies des entreprises en aval de la production sont mieux comprises et sont mieux accompagnées. Et la compréhension aussi des déterminants de changement des agriculteurs, je crois qu'on va avoir des exposés sur ces questions ce matin, je pense que c'est important. Et toutes ces questions-là sont... En, en sont donc sur l'agenda de recherche de ces nouveaux projets de recherche qui vont démarrer euh, au printemps prochain en, en France. Voilà, je crois que j'ai à peu près fini. Alors, du coup, en conclusion, bah, ce que je peux dire, c'est deux choses. C'est que d'une part, il y a une initiative portée par l'INRA et d'autres organismes de recherche européens, en Allemagne, au Danemark et dans, dans la plupart... Enfin, dans, plusieurs pays européens, sur euh, la construction d'un agenda de recherche euh, zéro pesticide. À la manière dont on a construit notre programme en France, on travaille à construire avec nos partenaires un agenda zéro pesticide dont on espère qu'il pourra être pris en charge au niveau d'Horizon Europe sur un programme de recherche euh, ambitieux sur... Euh, euh, c est, c est ce besoin de préparer l'avenir en investissant dès maintenant des thématiques de recherche plus ou moins fondamentales sur ces questions. Alors ensuite, je ne crois pas, je crois que la recherche est très utile, je ne crois pas que ce soit suffisant. Je pense qu'il faut simultanément s'interroger, travailler sur, euh, à mieux comprendre et à agir sur les, les, les moteurs de la transition écologique comme, qui sont dans les mains des agriculteurs, mais pas seulement. Je pense qu'il y a vraiment une question de nouveau contrat social entre l'agriculture et la société sur cette question de transition agroécologique. Et ça ne peut pas se faire sans avoir des politiques publiques euh, euh, qui, qui agissent, qui aident, qui, qui, qui incitent, qui rémunèrent ou qui interdisent au niveau national, comme bien entendu au niveau de la, de la nouvelle politique agricole commune. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Merci Florence. On a, on a un petit peu de temps pour si vous avez des, 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 des questions à lui, à, à lui, à lui poser. Euh, sur donc ce, cette, cette approche du côté de la, de la recherche. Please. Thank you Florence for your very nice presentation. Um... I just wanted to say, when you presented your 10-year uh, result on the ecophyto, I was one factor missing for me, and it was social sustainability. What about improvement of your so social sustainability for farmers by reducing their pesticide use, in terms of also looking at possible effects of the environmental health, of course, improved somehow due to the pollution, but also possible health effects towards humans and, uh, and having a more resilient system, being it more biodiverse, I think you get a more resilient system, so intrinsically more sustainable also to any change that, that comes in. Um, how did you perceive that or how does Indra tries to, I know it's a factor that is not easy to validate or to put in an objective scientific as we are all scientists positively thinking uh, to put, but are you thinking in future to take that along? Because if we talk sustainability, I think economics, social, and environment are the three pillars. Uh, alors, je pense que sur, quand on fait un bilan des cofito aujourd'hui, ce qu'on fait un bilan des, de ce qui s'est passé pendant ces dix années, on voit des choses où on ne voit rien en fonction du grain auquel, euh, de l'échelle à laquelle on se place. Si on regarde les statistiques nationales, les résultats ne sont pas, sont pas agréables du tout. On a effectivement une, une poursuite des baisses des indicateurs de biodiversité. On a une augmentation, continué une augmentation des pesticides. Euh, on n'a pas de données de, de, sur la santé des, des agriculteurs en tendance, mais... Euh, mais c'est un point qui, a, qui, qui fait... Enfin, les études 
voilà, qui commence à sortir montre qu'il peut y avoir une relation entre un certain nombre de pathologies. En revanche, si on regarde avec un détail plus fin, ce qu'on ne voit pas dans ces statistiques globales, parce que je pense que c'est des phénomènes trop minoritaires, c'est qu'à côté des, de la conversion vers l'agriculture biologique qui est, masse, qui est importante, il y a beaucoup de prise de conscience par les agriculteurs et de volonté de changer de pratique. Et on a plein d'expériences sur le terrain d'agriculteurs qui, euh, pour des raisons, ce qu'ils vont prendre en compte pour des raisons personnelles, euh, plus ou moins discutées ou décidées collectivement éventuellement, que l'on peut qualifier de préférence sociale ou environnementale, peut-être des préoccupations pour leur santé, mais aussi euh, une autre man, une autre une prise en compte réelle de la préoccupation de protection de l'environnement qui leur est adressée par la société et qui change de pratique. Et ça, c'est dit pour l'instant, j'arrive pas ou on n'arrive pas à le quantifier. On, on arrive juste à, à décrire des expériences locales, des, des, euh, des, des récits d'agriculteurs. Il y a des travaux de recherche en sciences sociales actuellement sur la description à la fois de ces phénomènes et des motivations du coup des agriculteurs qui vont, qui vont faire ce changement-là. Et donc oui, je pense que ça se passe, je ne sais pas vous dire, non, mais voilà. Et donc je pense que c'est un, un des points encourageants et peut-être quand même un des résultats du plan Ecofito que de, que de, faire, de contribuer à ce que cela change. Et j'espère que ça va être aussi ça avec le programme de recherche que l'on lance, qui au-delà des travaux de recherche euh, particuliers qui vont être financés, qui produiront des résultats, donne un, une ambiance, un cap nouveau à la recherche agronomique dans son ensemble, mais également à tous ceux qui sont à l'écoute. De... Alors l'INRA... L'INRA travaille sur du zéro pesticide, ça veut dire les instituts techniques en France, ça veut dire l'ensemble de l'écosystème recherche-développement qui est autour, qui, euh, qui se met à penser autrement. I, 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 have, I have three, three floors and I will stop here if you want just to not uh, losing the, the, the agenda and, uh, and so on. Please. Oh, merci. Um... Je m'appelle Eddie Wack de Politico, je suis journaliste. Je vais parler en français et ah, en anglais en fait um, parce que c'est mieux pour tout le monde. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean we had the Echo Fito one which lasted 10 years, you were, you were talking about that 2008-2018. I mean I've got two questions. Firstly, is that we now have Echo Fito Plan 2. I mean is there going to be any actual consequence if nothing happens Or we're just going to have to keep having more and more sort of, uh, you know, Echo Fito 3, Echo Fito 4. What do you think the likelihood is that this, <clears throat> this second plan, I know you don't, you're not from the French Agriculture Ministry itself, but just as an expert, what do you think the likelihood is that this will be the last Echo Fito that we will need? And, um, and secondly, you know, do you, think, do you think it's likely, you said that we won't reduce pesticides by 25% by 2020, of course, we're almost there. How likely is it that the French government will be able to... Um, stop all the uses of glyphosate by 2022 because these, these, this seems to be a very close goal. Um, I hope I get your point. You mean, your, your question is that it will that, uh, pardon, est-ce qu'il va y avoir un plan Ecofito 3 et 4 et... Est-ce que, qu'est-ce qui se passe si les Ecofito ne marchent pas L'Ecofito 1 n'a pas marché Qu'est-ce qui se passe si l'écofito 2 ne marche pas qu Est-ce qu'on est qu fera un écofito 3 ou est -ce Oui, a... je ne sais pas répondre. À... J'ai compris cette question, mais je me demandais s'il y avait quelque chose qui m'avait échappé parce que je cherchais à, à, à y répondre. C'est vrai que c'est un peu perturbant de penser que l'écofito 2 renforce les instruments d'écofito 1 qui n'ont pas marché. Néanmoins, je pense qu'il y a des choses nouvelles euh, dans l'écofito 2 je pense que ça ne suffira pas. Je crois que, c'est ce que je voulais dire en conclusion, cest je pense que s'il n'y a pas des, un enrichissement de ce plan qui vient de démarrer et qu'on 2 plus, plus fort en termes en terme d'incitation, on n'aura pas les 50% de réduction en 2025. C'est sûr qu'on ne les aura pas. 
Bon, est-ce que c'est très grave que derrière un écophyto 2, il y ait un écophyto 3 Non, je ne pense pas. Je pense que c'est plutôt une bonne nouvelle, à condition qu'on sent qu'on prenne le, le bon chemin à un moment donné qui soit, et qui soit euh, mesurable euh, au niveau global. Je pense que pour l'instant, c'est comme je le disais juste avant, on n'a pas ces résultats là, mais je pense qu'il euh, y a suffisamment de signaux positifs pour avoir espoir que, en tout cas, la tendance va s'infléchir et tout d'un coup, on va commencer à avoir des baisses et, qui se verront visibles au niveau de la consommation de pesticides globale. Oui, bonjour, Emmanuel Berling, DG Agri à la Commission. Euh, je voulais revenir sur le Conseil, le Conseil agricole. Euh, dans, dans la PAC, il y a un, il y a un élément qui s'appelle le système de Conseil agricole et qui a en particulier euh, cette, ce, ce volet pesticides, l'utilisation durable des pesticides. Euh, vous n'avez pas, dans la liste des, des éléments des volets de l'écophyto, vous n'avez pas insisté ou pas, pas signalé un volet euh, Conseil et euh, il nous semble de notre côté que c'est quelque chose de très important, notamment en termes d'avertissement euh, agricole, euh, les, les systèmes d'avertissement précoces pour euh, signaler aux agriculteurs les risques phytosanitaires. Et c'est un élément clé de, de la lutte intégrée, de la, des alternatives aux pesticides. Est-ce que vous pourriez re revenir un petit peu sur oui. cet aspect conseil dans l'écophyto oui, oui, parce qu'il y, y a un volet conseil dans l'écophyto. Il y a d'une part un volet, enfin il y a deux choses sur le conseil qu'on peut dire. D'une part il y a eu une décision qui a été prise sur la séparation du conseil et de la vente. Donc maintenant les entreprises qui font de la, de la vente de produits phytosanitaires ne peuvent plus faire du conseil sur l'usage de ces produits phytosanitaires. Donc ça c'est un grand changement qui fait un peu des remous. Hein. Je sais, on pourrait en discuter longuement parce qu'il n'y a pas que des aspects positifs, en particulier les coopératives agricoles qui avaient des services de vente et de conseil doivent choisir, est-ce qu'elles font de la vente ou est-ce qu'elles font du conseil Mais vous imaginez bien que c'est fait pour euh, des, euh, défaire, en gros, euh, la, la, la notion de conseil, de l'intérêt économique de la vente. Et puis, il y a un autre aspect qui est peut-être plus en réponse à votre question. Dans Ecofito a été créé un dispositif qui s'appelle le bulletin de santé du végétal et qui est un dispositif d'observation des, des pathogènes et d'informations à disposition des services de conseil justement. Euh, on peut être très critique sur ce dispositif parce qu'à la fois il est très bien et il, euh, et, et parce qu'il permet de mieux suivre euh, la pression euh, des pressions des, des bioagresseurs et d'en informer euh, les gens qui sont ensuite censés conseiller les agriculteurs et en même temps il se traduit beaucoup, dans beaucoup de cas par des alertes euh, qui peuvent éventuellement affoler ou, ou, ou inciter euh, à traiter. À partir du moment où on observe, on voit et on dit « attention, il y a une arrivée de je ne sais quoi, de, 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 de méligette euh, prochaine, euh, euh, préparez-vous, préparez-vous, ça génère de l'anxiété et préparez-vous à traiter ». Et donc, dans le programme de recherche dont je parle, j'en ai pas parlé dans les listes des thématiques, mais on a mis un volet spécifique sur la création d'un dispositif d'épidémiosurveillance qui pourrait favoriser la prophylaxie. Donc, on a un, un, un accent là-dessus. Et donc, on peut imaginer plein de choses en termes de recherche. Hein. C'est tout, tout le numérique qui va être mobilisé sur des capteurs pour déceler de manière très précocement euh, les, 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 les maladies ou, ou, et les mises en réseau d'informations, tout ça à disposition des gens sur des, sur des téléphones portables. Enfin, on peut imaginer que la recherche peut faire plein de choses là-dessus. Mais la vraie question qui est dedans, en fait, c'est comment faire pour que cette information et ce meilleur suivi ils, ils, ils se traduisent par le fait d'utiliser moins pesticides. Donc il faut qu'ils soient orientés sur euh, la mesure aussi des actions de prophylactique qui pourraient être prises et des effets d'action prophylactique. Et donc c'est ça, pour l'instant, c'est est ça qui est proposé, est proposé à la recherche de travailler. Comment mettre en place un dispositif dont le... Dont le, dont le, le L'effet, l'impact ne, ne serait pas bah « tiens, il y a une maladie, donc je traite, la menace, il faut le savoir ». Et donc, comment, et en particulier la notion de, voilà, de seuil, de seuil de traitement, etc., pour être dedans. And last but not least. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Isabella Lang and I work for I4MEU, the European uh, umbrella organization for organic farmers. And I'm just coming back from Germany uh, from last month to visit some organic fruit growers, organic hops growers, uh, which is something very rare because there are only six organic hops growers in the whole Germany. This is why I mention it is because um, you mentioned the long-term research projects, and this is something we are really interested in to have uh, because this redesign of the system um, is very important. I would completely agree on you, but um, with research projects of five, six years, it's very difficult to look into orchards, uh, which are like 10, 12 years uh, of duration, on wine growing, hops. These are the areas where we really have to reduce the inputs. And on the other side, it's, it's very difficult to look into it if we have like Horizon 2020 research projects that last usually four years. And for, me, for us, it's really the question, how can we align these research projects to the cycles on the farms and the reality of the farmers? Because a real redesign and real studies need to be uh, 10, 15 years. So what is, do you have some cons thoughts about that? Oui, vous avez raison, mais ceci dit, les, 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 les projets de recherche qui sont, s'articulent en général à des dispositifs de recherche qui sont beaucoup plus durables que ça. Euh, à l'INRA, en France, dans, du côté d'Avignon, il y a la, une grosse équipe de recherche qui travaille en arboriculture et ils ont des expérimentations depuis longtemps qui sont menées euh, en articulant les différents projets de recherche qui vont vien, venir ensuite financer. Dans la même manière, dans Ecofito. Euh, défis expérimentation, les expérimentations, c'est des projets de 4 ans, mais en général, au bout de 4 ans, les gens qui ont fait un bon travail sur un verger, ils vont re re obtenir un nouveau projet. Donc là, nous, dans, dans, dans ce nouvel euh, programme, on a fait des projets de 6 ans par rapport, à ce, par rapport à 3 ans, qui est habituellement la norme en France au niveau de la NR. Donc euh, il faut ajuster le, le terme d'un travail de recherche à la fois à ce que vous dites et à la fois aussi à, à la vie d'un chercheur qui va pouvoir pendant six ans euh, coordonner correctement un programme ambitieux. Mais au bout d'un certain temps, il aura peut-être envie de passer à autre chose. Many, many thanks to, to our two key speakers for this introduction, Martin. You will be back uh, in, the, in the floor. You will be back in the floor for the, oh, yes. for the end of yeah, uh, for the, the final round table. Florence, as usual. Thank you, merci. And now I, I, can, I can call the two next speaker. One is uh, Eric Matej, usual victim in this kind of, of event, and, uh, and, and so on, who is uh, uh, quite, uh, I was saying old, I'm sorry. Uh, working things a long time <laughs> on, on the issue of uh, resilience, sustainability, and so on. We, we, we share some research program together in Transmango and in Sure Farms and, and, and so on. And uh, he, he will speak exactly about, about that transition, ecological transition. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry how my the Spaniard I have will pronounce your Danish name, and I already apologize for that. Uh, Herr Hersten Nielsen. Very good. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, who will who will address another, I think, important issue, which is uh, the the ecological transition has to be done with the farmer. And uh, well, why the farmer will 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 start uh, participating in this, in this process, understanding the, their behavior and how to, to make them the real actors of, of the change. And I think it's the issue and she will develop with his long experience on governance and, 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 and so on. Eric, you, you have the floor. And I hope Thank you, Thomas. we will continue to, to respect the timetable and, uh, 
and so on. I, think I understand I have 10 minutes, 15 yeah. minutes, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, and actually, when I saw the program and I uh, uh, saw my colleague's uh, presentation, I decided to change my title and also change my content a little bit to provoke a little bit of um, debate and controversy. So my point is actually that I, um, I'm a bit critical of the current approaches in how our communities are trying to uh, make about the ecological transition. I actually d disagree already with this title of this conference, which is that agronomy is the start of everything, right? Which I think is part of the problem. I'm not saying that economics is the start of everything. That would be a bit too, um, um, you know, too economic. But th I think my main thesis is that um, we are approaching uh, the ecological transition in general and yet too much as a technology adoption problem, as something that you know, farmers need to do. It's in terms of desired compliance, in terms of incentives that we need to put onto them so they change, which translates into their practice onto a focus on costs and say, well, this is too costly. And then you have taxes and yeah, what's even more costly uh, and your know, price needs to change and that's it. Uh, I, my my antithesis and well, if you have a thesis and an antithesis, that should also be a synthesis. Uh, so I, I believe we need to combine also these other approaches, is that we need to also look into the, the fit of these approaches, of these practices, into the strategic and operational practices of farmers, uh, which we can call business model. And business model is more than just costs and benefits. And that's what I want to show, show today. It's not just you know, tampering with costs and benefits, it's much more. And I think that if we neglect this much more, then we, um, we are missing p a big piece of the, of the puzzle. So that's my thesis, and I'm, I'm, I don't say that the other part, of course agronomy is important, of course ecology is important. Without that, you don't have an ecological transition, but I think we also need to, to take that into account, this other part. Just to give you a, a, a flavor of how actually most, and actually I won't go too much into detail because my colleague will represent more the, uh, what we call in, in social science, the behavioral approach, uh, or part of it. Uh, there is actually you know, two ongoing Horizon 2020 projects. One is on, on four years and one in three years. Uh, one is called LIFT, which is uh, coordinated by INRA REN, by Laure Latruf. The other one is called UNICECO, which is coordinated by the, the Thunen Institute, and both of them are, are in parallel looking at low input uh, farming in, in Europe. So they're both looking into basically agroecological practices. And, um, uh, and also there was a recent uh, uh, publication by uh, some people of the GRC who made a literature review or an overview study of, as you can see here, the, the title, the, uh, the behavioral factors affecting the adoption of sustainable farming practices policy-oriented review, and I'm, I'm sure some of these insights will come back later on in, in the conference. And typically the kind of uh, frameworks that we use, because I'm also part of this LIFT project, looks like this. Yeah? It's, it's like, well, there is a there is behavior that needs to be changed, and uh, so this is the, the framework used in the LIFT project. And, you know, what, what, what matters is motivations. We already heard uh, that, uh, you know, farmers who are more environmentally concerned will be more motivated. Uh, to make these changes. There is a, an aspect of identity, uh, there is an aspect of social norms. Uh, as uh, behavioral economists, we, we try to, to work on these, on these nudging. Can we nudge farmers into the desired behavior? Um, and of course, there are some contextual far factors. And of course, some of these contextual factors are being acknowledged, which is, for example, the supply chain actors, as Florence indicated. Uh, you know, isn't there a lock-in? Uh, isn't there something else going on? But, but the main focus is on the farmer as a person, you know, and, and actually the farm is, is even considered a context and everything else is being seen as context. Where I would like to say, well, no, it's, you know, it's, it's not only the farmer, it's not only the psychology, it's also the business side of things. This is actually the framework of the, uh, the GRC people. You know, they say, well, basically we have some cognitive factors, so it's in the head of the farmer. You have some social factors. Uh, it's the it's the other farmers. It's the it's uh, it's the um, it's the advisors. Uh, I, I would say that one of the one of the main uh, uh, 
uh, influencing factors is, the, is, is the, the whole system surrounding the farmers, not only the advisors, not only the researchers, not only the farmer unions, you know, the, but everything uh, together. And there are some what you could call dispositional factors. And if you look, you know, so, so as an economist, as a business economist, I would say, well, where is the economic, economics? And yes, it's, it's somewhere over there, you know, perceived cost and benefits. Yeah? Uh, there's something about farming objectives, but, you know, it's mostly about other factors. So agronomy meets psychology. I think that's a good step forward, but I would like to plead for agronomy meeting um, psychology meeting business. So what, what are some of the conclusions of, of these behavioral studies? Unfortunately, I cannot report on the uh, results of the LIFT projects because they're still, the experiments and the survey are still going on. And to, to give you a bit of a flavor, uh, what we are uh, investigating there is the role of supply chain uh, of contracts, for example, on the one hand and what kind of attributes need to be changing in contracts, so some, some choice experiments that are being done on this, in this respect. And on the other hand, uh, the role of, of collaboration between farmers. How can farmers collaborate, for example, in uh, uh, sharing machinery uh, for the ecological transition? So these are two of the elements that we're looking at and lift. But we're also making a special emphasis to, to maybe come back on the social sustainability issues on the uh, the effects on labor, on labor costs, and on labor uh, issues, eh? because that's, I think, a very important uh, aspect of the ecological transition. Now, com coming back on these behavioral studies, as you as you can read together with me, they conclude that you know extra extra version, so being open to other people, openness to new experiences, even risk seeking, moral concern, environmental concern, lifestyle farming objectives. These are the factors that are associated with higher adoption of sustainable practices. And conversely, being resistant to change and moved by economic objectives makes farmers reluctant to convert. Now, I find that a very um, uh, concerning conclusion, uh, uh, not concerning, uh, a very um, how you say, um, worrisome conclusion, right? Because what we observe in Europe is kind of a polarization. On the one hand, I mean, what we observe is a polarization of farmers becoming more and more economic. On the one hand, far bigger, real business operators. And on the other hand, more and more farmers, small farmers, you know, local farmers. But the middle is, is kind of disappearing more and more. And this kind of conclusions kind of teaches that, well, we, we, can, we, can, you know, we, can, we can convince the non-economic farmers, the hobby farmers, some would say, or some of them, not all of them, of, of course. But, you know, the economic farmers, you know, yeah, that's not the, we're not going to change them with these behavioral uh, kind of incentives. There's something else going on there. And they even state that in a more long term strategy, you know, well, maybe we can increase their, their concerns. I think that's quite a, I mean, people's, how people think about the world is something that is not so easy to change even in the long run. Promoting conservation as a farming objective as well as boosting consumer willingness to pay for environmentally friendly food. Here again, what I see missing is, well, a farmer is selling to a trader or a cooperative or a processor. You know, the, there is a, you know, a whole set of actors missing in, in, in these conclusions that I think are very crucial in bringing about the ecological uh, transition. So behavioral studies, I mean, we do some of them ourselves. So. I'm quite critical here for the sake of, of, of the argument. They have attention for perceived costs and benefits. They have attention for risk, for the perceived control of, uh, you know, adopting these new technologies. S a little bit for the role of supply chain actors, but not sufficiently, and also for final consumers, even what they call the type of practice that matters. But I think a conversion to organic farming is something completely different to adopting IPM on your farm. But they tend to miss what I would say a business or a managerial approach. You know, to what extent do these um, these practices fit with the way uh, farming is being done operationally and a day-to-day -day practice, but especially also strategically, and that refers back to this aspect of business model. In other words, to change your practice, it's not enough to just you know substitute one technology by another, which is often how. Uh, especially more natural scientists look at, at the problem, it also requires a change of business model. Now, everybody's talking about business models, but nobody's ever giving a definition about business models, so let me do that then. 
No, before that, I, I just want to point out to a very interesting study uh, um, published a couple of months ago by a, a set of uh, a group of uh, sociologists uh, uh, under the guidance of Jan Doe van der Ploeg, uh, probably well known by many of you. Uh, basically, uh, basically uh, uh, confirming what I'm, I'm saying is that if you compare agroecological farmers to, let's say, conventional or what they call industrial farmers, you can see that their business model is fundamentally different. You know, where conventional farmers are more are optimizing their gross value of production per unit of labor versus agroecological farmers, on the other hand, uh, that are, 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 are having, because of their, the labor intensity of, of uh, ecological farming, you know, they, they don't perform very well in terms of total sales per labor unit or income per labor unit, but they are more focusing on value added, uh, which is uh, sales minus, uh, minus variable costs. Uh, divided by gross value of production. So they have a different focus, they optimize different things, uh, which is more than just, you know, benefits and costs. It's also that, you know, the, 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 the cost structure is fundamentally different, for example. And in the same publications, they, they say there is five strategic differences between agroecology and, as they call it, industrial agriculture. Uh, one is a higher reliance on internal resources. And I think that most of the focus also on agronomy is about these internal resources. Internal resources means nature-based solutions. But they're also less specialized. They have a more diversified output. They have a higher focus on the use efficiency of these internal resources through synergies, whereas industrial agriculture focus on the use efficiency of the external resources. Precision agriculture wants to have a higher efficiency of resources that you buy from outside including pesticides. Fourthly, the centrality of labor in farming, eh? that's much more labor intensive, which means that also technical efficiency increases are generated within the farm rather than kind of bought from outside by buying in technology. And fifthly, and this hints a little bit to the broader sense of a business model, uh, that's the, that they tend to have more, better alliances or more alliances among farmers uh, horizontally, but also with consumers to get to better leading, of course, not eating, to better prices. So what is a business model? A business model addresses how value is created. So the value creation, what is it that you are offering? The value capture, how you capture that value, which is a cost and a revenue issue, and also how you deliver that value. What are kind of processes uh, in your farm, in your business, in how to do that? And it just made a little exercise. And so the business model components or the questions that you need to ask yourself is how do we create value? Who do we create value for? What is our source of competence? How do we competitively position ourselves? How do we make money? And what are our ambitions in terms of time, scope, and size? And I, I, I applied this. This is very, very quick. This is ongoing research. I don't know whether you can actually read this because it's pretty small. I apply this kind of thinking to uh, comparing a conventional farm with a CSA farm, just two extremes, eh? a community supported farm, in which, for example, and it starts with the offering. The offering is already, the value uh, uh, proposition is already very different. In a conventional farm, it's a standardized product, a bulk product, sorted and packaged eh, for some, uh, with relatively narrow product lines, eh, very specialized. Uh, being um, uh, uh, um, sold in indirectly in, in multi-channel distribution eh? in a very anonymous way. Whereas a CSA farm eh, will have a broader mix. It's still a limited mix. It's still only vegetables or, and fruit, for example. But well, par part of the offering is also the on-farm uh, experience, broader lines and direct distribution. If you look at the market, markets are quite different. In conventional farming, it's a business-to-business -business context, much more international, wholesale-oriented, transactional. It's about transactions, whereas in a, in a CSA, CSA context, it's business-to-consumer, it's local, it's much more relational. If you look at internal capability, it's, it's the production side of things that make, make a difference uh, with, of course, in a CSA context, an agroecology in context, it's these internal resources that make, make a difference. But if you look at competitive strategy, 
well, I'm sorry to say, but in, in conventional farming, it's low costs. Yeah, it's Ryanair. Yeah. Whereas in a, in, in, in a CSA context, uh, the competitive strategy is one which is what we call in business uh, terms intimate customer relationships. Yeah. As you can see, I'm using general business, business terms taught in business schools and apply them to farming. Uh, the economics, uh, uh, spot markets that tend to dominate uh, high volume, low margin, uh, whereas in, in the CSA farm, it's, it's based on a completely different model, in this case with a prepaid membership fee, uh, with, uh, with lower values, uh, with medium mar margin, and also the objectives change, uh, where one is income or profit, uh, and the other uh, side is subsistence. Well, no, the problem is, of course, the CSA model seems to be an interesting business model, but it's very difficult to upscale that. Uh, so, uh, what is missing in both models is actually, well, first of all, yeah, we need to have a broader product mix into staple food. Let's not only talk about fruit and vegetables, let's also talk about la grande culture. Eh? Let's also talk about livestock and, and, and about cereals. Eh? Um, I think what we need is a business-to-business-to-consumer -business approach, an integrated approach. And this is what I don't like about Brussels, is that Brussels is very much against supply, the Brussels our communities are very much, or some of the Brussels communities surrounding agriculture are against supply chain coordination. They are against vertical coordination. My message is the solution is in vertical coordination. Just one example, Barilla, uh, the famous pasta producer that has contracts that actually promote rotation amongst farmers because they, they collaborate with the sugar cooperative and they jointly offer uh, rotation-based contracts to farmers. That's the kind of innovations we need to make ro uh, diversification, rotation, ecological transition, I think, uh, uh, necessary. Uh, so supply chain management and thinking in, in, in addition to production system thinking uh, is, is really needed. Uh, I'll skip this one. For those who are interested, these are some of the barriers, uh, some of the learning from circular economy business models. I don't have time anymore, so I'll jump to my conclusions. Which is basically that, uh, as my colleague will, will probably demonstrate, behavioral factors do matter for ecological transition, but it's very context specific. It depends on the system, it depends on the country, it depends on the region, it depends on the type of farmer, it depends on his neighbors, who are his neighbors or not. It depends on all of, of these things. So to, to have a policy that targets you know, all these aspects at the same time, I think that's very difficult. I think a change in agricultural practice needs to go hand in hand with a change in business model. And as I, as I have demonstrated, the business model is more than just cost and benefit. And so an, an attention that is now more mainly on, uh, on the internal value delivery model and everything else is outside the scope of, of our transition, I think needs to be expanded uh, including, you know, how value is created and captured, including supply chain management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I think you have made a fantastic transition to the next speaker. Uh, Hel, uh, Hele. Hele. Very good. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Apologize again. The, no, no. You're good. Please. Yes. Uh, so uh, the title of my speech here or talk is the policy instruments for ecological transition, understanding farmers' motivation and decision styles. So like Eric says, very much a behavioral focus. But why is that? Well, as we heard uh, Florent Chaquet mention in France, in Europe, in Denmark, where I'm from, we've had many years of uh, pesticide policies or policies trying to get farmers to adopt sustainable practices. And some progress has been made, but we're far from there. And one of uh, the arguments that I have based on research me and my colleague, I've done with colleagues is that um, actually that policies have not been designed with a proper understanding of farmers. I think research we're there in terms of be, we, we have more of a focus on behavior now. At least what I've seen in the policy uh, community, there's less of that. It's, so either policies are designed based on what's politically acceptable what we can get through, or it's based on idealized assumptions about farmers as economic man. And let me be clear from the beginning, I'm not saying at all farmers are not, oops, farmers are not businesses. Obviously they are. If they don't act as businesses, their bankers will come after them and make sure that they're not 
completely neglecting the economic side. We're just saying we think there's um, a, a broader uh, perspective on farmers here. A little bit of what was that? background on Denmark, we 61% of the land is farmed. Uh, that sits on top of the groundwater, which is uh, the source of our drinking water. And we drink largely untreated drinking water in Denmark. That's been a key principle. It has broad public support. So there is, in general, a real understanding that we need to protect our groundwater from pesticides and other uh, pollutants. So we've had these successive um, pesticide action plans since the 1980s. They've been more or less successful. We have seen pesticide uh, use reduced, uh, but much less than was anticipated by economic modeling. So much of many of our policy instruments were based on ex ante models, uh, based on research. So it's not as if they were just done out of out of the blue. So what we are saying is, let's try to check the behavioral assumptions that were put into these models and which policy was then formulated. And they are basically the f seeing the farmer as a profit maximizer. So driven by economic gain as one aspect, what motivates farmers, and the other is also an assumption that the farmer acts sort of as a computer um, optimizing formula. So I will talk about, illustrate where this goes wrong, perhaps with two pesticide taxes we had, uh, we've had. So the first one, was uh, implemented in the mid-90s, and it was a value-added tax. It was based on the retail price, and at the time it was fairly high, 54% on insecticides. And the objective here was that we the treatment frequency should go down to um, what 1.7, so that's just the indicator here. Uh, and that was based on multiple um, uh, modeling exercises that showed that actually if farmers were economically optimal, this would be the level that would make sense. So it wasn't about farmers on average losing money. So where you see the blue line here is the is actually the treatment free, the development in the treatment frequency in indicator over the years uh, going up and down. Now this is based on sales. So where you see the two in 96, 98, uh, the tax was introduced, you see a lot of stockpiling before that. And so initially after the tax was introduced, the farmers were using products off the shelves. So there you see sales going down. But once those stockpiles were used, you see sales and use of pesticides increase again. So it may be that it would have been economically optimal, but clearly that was not how farmers were thinking. They were not, uh, they, they did not respond in the way it was anticipated. So we looked into this. We've done uh, surveys both in uh, 2009, and we've repeated it since, where we were asking farmers, OK, so when you apply, when you make decision, decisions about uh, pesticides, how important are these uh, different objectives for the use of, uh, for your use of pesticides? And let me say, these are average farmers. These, well, they're actually, we don't have the small ones. Everybody. It, it, we don't have hobby farmers. Um, so these are all, and Danish farmers are um, very professionalized. They are very business oriented. They're fairly large. So what we see here is, um, as you can tell, it's, it's a fairly complex. I mean, motivation is a composite. It's not like either I follow the money or I follow something else. It's obviously a mix and different people prioritize different objectives at different times in different contexts, like you say. But on average, what we see is that farmers uh, tend to really focus on crop yield. They tend to focus on not getting, you know, getting out ahead of problems, having clean fields. Prices of pesticides are less, uh, are slightly uh, less important. And this is important when you want to use taxes or other economic instruments to regulate behavior. It, for that to work, people need to focus on, ta on, on prices. Um, so what we also did then was we tried to see if, we could, if farmers grouped, and we do find a grouping of farmers, three, two of them are, are, are more interesting than others, than the third one, I think. So we do have about half of the farmers 
that when we analyze by cluster analysis, they actually do tend to focus mostly on prices when they make decisions. Then we have a group of one third of the farmers who are the ones who really enter um, the, the production, the crop yield and the clean fields. And, and we, don't, we don't think it's, it's about optimizing economics uh, primarily. It's really more of a professional value is what we gain both from interviews, but also because these actually are much less inclined to look at prices. So, so they're really into what can I get out of my field. It's more of a professional pride and, and meaningfulness. What we also then did was ask these farmers now if we had a significant increase in taxes or you know, a number of other policy instruments, how likely are you to react? And we did actually see that the ones who said they are more price oriented said they would respond to a significant tax increase. Vice versa, the ones who are really focused on ensuring the crop yield also said they would be less likely to, uh, for, to decrease. So this was the old tax and, uh, and fairly rather old data for farmers from, from uh, before we then introduced, or the Danish politicians introduced a new tax as part of a pesticide plan because because, as you saw, pesticide use continued to increase. So um, in June 2012, a new tax pesticide ta or a pesticide plan was adopted, but the key instrument there was a pesticide tax that was redesigned, and it was implemented in the summer of 13. So what's really important about this one is that instead of just being evaluated, it was differentiated according to the impact of each product uh, on the environment and health, uh, based on a new indicator that was then called the pesticide load indicator. So what is the load of the pesticide used on an average hectare in the country? And that's the policy indicator they're following. There was an increase in tax rates. On average, they increased 125 by 125%. What this means was that more harmful uh, pesticides, some of them quadrupled in price. Then you have less harmful ones uh, where they were actually, the price was actually decreased. Importantly also, the revenue was returned to the farmers. This was not a fiscal instrument. Some of it is used to fund research uh, and innovation, but most of the uh, revenue was returned to farmers. The objective was to um, reduce the pesticide load measured by this indicator by 40% in sales between 2011 and 2015. And then later on, when the plan was continued, this was reformulated as we want pesticide load to come down to an indicator level of 1.96. In the interest of time, I won't go into the uh, design, but let me show here what happened then. Um, so sales, as I said, their, their objective was to uh, reduce the pesticide load indicator by 40%. That's the gray line. That policy objective has been achieved, as you see, but you also see, again, stockpiling, and then you see these huge um, ups and downs in the sales, so that sales is just not a very good indicator of anything. So instead, now we have access as researchers, but also as policymakers, uh, to actual use through mandated electronic um, uh, pesticide journals that farmers have to submit every year. So what you see here is the orange line is the, uh, is the use in, uh, in the pesticide load. And you see a decrease. Uh, if we take 2011 as the base here, it's decreasing 27%. You can always discuss baseline here. But importantly, the... <coughs> The level seems to have stabilized. It has come down significant, significantly. It is still above what was predicted in the economic models. It is not down to, because again, the, the, the objective was based on economic modeling. We're still above that. The objective is 1.96. Currently, we're at, it's at 2.17, I think. But we do see, if you look into the numbers, you do see that the sales of the really expensive, more harmful products have gone down where there's an alternative. So if a farmer feels like there's no alternative, or if there's very few alternatives and they fear resistance, they're probably still gonna pay the higher price, going back to 
maybe your point also here. Two minutes? Okay, thank you. So, but but we do see that this tax has has uh, helped substitution away from the most harmful products to the less harmful ones, and in that sense, it's it uh, seems to be successful. So, let's see here. Why has this new tax been effective? Well, some, I mean, obviously, what what we see here is that the <coughs> price signal is much stronger than what we had before. And so that goes back to my initial point. I mean, if you have a very strong price signal, you're going to, you are going to activate uh, the, the economic motivation to a stronger degree. And so, I mean, obviously, you could just set it even higher and you would catch everybody. We still don't have everybody responding. You could also say that the price signals, what is, it makes it easier to understand what are harmful products, what are less harmful products. That helps farmers who are, who are environmentally oriented. And we think also it does actually allows farmers to substitute uh, towards more sustainable, to sustainable products they can still treat. So they don't have the sense they're just leaving things out there, but they can use different products. Even so, um, it's still not completely in line with what was modeled based on economic optimization models. We have survey data where about half the farmers said they did substitute to new pesticides primarily because of price changes. We also see in our new survey, uh, combining survey data with uh, the actual use, that the farmers who score higher on these production objectives, they have a higher pesticide load. They continue to use more harmful pesticides, whereas farmers not so surprising, farmers with environmental objectives have actually a lower pesticide use now. But we also see that farmers who worry about uh, pesticide resistance have higher pesticide load. So yes, I agree, we are talking about um, a very much a composite uh, picture. I don't necessarily think it means that then we have to make a policy for every single farmer. I think farmers do group. Uh, so it's important to understand, it's important to understand well, how do farmers measure success? And they do measure their own success uh, in different ways. So I had a slide here uh, just to say Danish farmers are not so special, going back all the way to 1973, but actually uh, much of this summarizes what Eric also showed from uh, some of the studies that have been done, several literature reviews showing all these composite uh, types of motivation. So I will, just two more slides. Um, just what we also know about what farmers say in addition to tax and motivation, what do they actually say about IPM practices, other sustainable practices. And what we see is that some say they have changed they are paying attention to when they sow to minimize weeds, so that's one way that they're applying uh, IPM practices. Uh, but if you see one, two is, are the ones who don't do something very much, so 50% are not very much into using advisor services on IPM. 20, only about a quarter of the farmers really are into that, which matches other data. Also very interesting when we ask farmers about different risk factors, Again, when we ask them, what, what kind of risks do you associate with the use of pesticides, the, their top scorer, 77%, uh, is that uh, if they reduce yield, then they're going to, then they're, or if they reduce pesticides, they're afraid they're going to reduce yield. On the other end of this, they are not very concerned about the risk to health or to pollution of groundwater. You have uh, more than half of the farmers who don't think it's very risky to uh, apply these uh, pesticides. And I think we have a good reason for that in this last slide, in the last, last figure, where we're asking, so uh, people, to what extent do you agree with this statement? And the statement is that the substances approved for use in Denmark are so harmless to the environment that we do not need to focus on reducing use. And you have um, half of the farmers uh, agree with this and you only have 21 percent to actually disagree with that and the reason we ask this is because we've heard this again and again in interviews if they're approved they must be safe so for implications can I have one minute for that uh, 
Um, three points. So we think that the, it's really, really important that you actually do know how farmers think and act uh, when you when you do these uh, uh, when you design policies. So yes, by all means, use economic models, but by all means, also be sure to integrate other sources of knowledge. Also, beware of the pharma heterogeneity. Means we can't have one type of policy instrument. We're going to need a mix that targets different. I mean, yes, again, we could do really prohibitively expensive uh, market-based instruments and everybody would react, but that has other downsides. So we need to find a mix that targets different types of farmers. And I think the most in interesting group there are the ones who are very production-oriented. And how can, we, uh, how can we reframe for them uh, what, what is good craftsmanship? Because that's what, what this is about. Different objectives, so some of that could be how do you actually you know, produce a crop with different, more sustainable practices. And that leads to the third point, involve stakeholders in policy design to make sure that what you do makes sense in the field. And I think that's not maybe so far from what you're saying, Eric, to come back to that. We need to understand also the, the context of which their part, their business change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think until now we have, we have seen how politicians or academics believe about what the farmer and the industry is doing. <laughs> uh, thanks God this, this seminar is, uh, is jointly organized by, by the Pesticide Action Network and also by the International Biocontrol Manufacturer Association and the International Organization for Biological Control, the industry, which uh, uh, will bring the, the, the reality of the industry in, in, in the room and, and we, we have also now in the second part of the, of the event, uh, we, have, we have also, also several farmers who will, who will uh, explain how they believe directly, not how we scientists, well, bracket scientists, we, we believe, uh, they believe, and, and so on. And, and I think it is this mixture between what the academy we are saying and what the actors, both from the industry and from the, from, and, and the real actors, the farmers, uh, said, I think it is this mixture who makes the, the, the big interest of, one of the big interests of this, of, of this session. I propose, therefore, to, to, to give the floor now to, well, one question, okay. Thank you, Hella, for your very nice presentation. When you say pricing is not an issue, I think you have to be careful and realize that it's very context specific, which motivation of farmers is. Personally, I walk around a lot in tropical agronomical systems. If we talk a crop like banana, it's all pricing, pricing, pricing. It's to do with the bad structure of the food value chain and the huge price pressure they're under. That's why the chlorpyrifos today uh, banned in Europe is still a, a big part of the cropping system there. So um, that's a very important one. I think as to trying to grasp uh, the motivation of farmers, um, it's a huge um, factor is, uh, is the farmer uh, with his throat like this on the prices or does he have his hands free to do something and to change something? I think everything starts with social fundamentals for all the farmers around the globe as to be able to actually get this transition going. Because if you're too busy feeding your family, you're not with your mind and your heart in let's change this and see what happens. The risk is just too big. And then um, on this Tax model, I think it's a very nice tax model. I think there is examples around Europe of harming, um, harming substances and harming practices being uh, receiving an eco tax. And I'm still wondering why that is not the case for substances where we now have an ID and a, a clue after all this time that it's harm, harmful for the environment as much as for the people. Yeah, I, d I don't want it to sound like I don't say prices are important. I, what, my quarrel is more with 
the ex ante modeling that goes into a lot of policy instruments in the part of the world where I am, where we just see it failing again and again. Absolutely, prices are important. And like you say, farmers are pressured by, you know, in Denmark, it's by bankers. You know, so obviously that happens. And by mono, I mean, if all you grow is, is bananas and there's a, you, you have, you know, a certain market, that, hap that, that makes a difference too. So yeah, it is, you have to look at where we are. But I think there is a measure in how important the price is that depends on the sh social fundamentals of the farmers. There is a trade-off there. Yeah. So that's an important trade-off to, to think about. Yep. Okay, thank you, Ele. Thank you, Eric, for, for your contribution. And I propose now we, we shift to an, to an uptake of the alternative across Europe. Uh, please, uh, the uh, responsible of this uh, uptake can join the floor. And uh, uh, we will... We will see even a geographical mapping of how we are in, in, in Europe. Thank Please. You so much. Turn it on. Good morning, and thank you, thank you, uh, Thomas, thank you, everybody here for for coming to the symposium today, um, hosted here in the, in the, in the Parliament. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, alternative uh, production methods, in particular the biocontrol technologies, and uh, just a thank you to to Pan because uh, a lot of this was uh, prepared in association with uh, with Pan. Moving on, this one. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about integrated pest management. There's a, a big chart behind me um, that I'll, I'll just run through so people uh, know what we're talking about. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the crop areas that are under uh, biological control and uh, some farmer experiences uh, that, that we have from traveling around and uh, videos and uh, interviews done uh, by PAN and IBMA. What we've actually learned about implementation from this, and then maybe what we need to do to accelerate the uptake of uh, IPM integrated pest management. Okay, so this looks quite busy. Um, the triangle's uh, there behind me, as well as on the screen here. Uh, but the main principle is really that the prevention or suppression of pests and diseases is really should be achieved by all the methods from the bottom up, and only when you really um, are stuck, really stuck, then um, you take uh, the more chemical approach. So the uh, terminology used in the triangle actually reflects the sustainable use directive. And so we already have in Europe a directive that actually tells us what integrated pest management is um, and how to do it. And really, the, the starting point is um, the agronomy, and the agronomy you see along the bottom line, whether it's uh, using buffer strips, whether it's using intercropping, um, but it's really thinking about the basics of, of how you're doing um, your farming. And that links into some of the previous speakers' comments, really, about the actual system. What is the farming system? What are the fundamentals of, of, of what's happening? Then the next uh, level up, uh, we started talking about monitoring, uh, forecasting, um, and this is really where a lot of the new technologies, the digital technologies, can start to help us improve this so that uh, we're able to optimise how we use some of the um, biological technologies as well as others. Then as you move higher up, you come to the natural control methods, uh, the mechanical control methods and then the biocontrol methods, and finally the, the chemistry. Really, sorry, I'll just go back one. What I'm really going to talk about predominantly are the biocontrol um, <laughs> technologies in this, in this talk. So I'm often asked, well, you know, does it work? Does biocontrol technology work? Can you really use IPM? Well, the first um, answer to that is yes. Um, but it varies according to crop as to how the uptake has gone and how much is used. When you look at... Um, 
protected crops, so particularly protected fruit and veg, then frankly, it's pretty much all biocontrol technologies. If you go into a tomato house today, um, they only use insects um, or, or pheromones or uh, microbial um, pesticides. So it's all biocontrol technologies. What's interesting is that when you look at a review of the uptake of IPM done by uh, Hub van Lentren, he asked himself, well, over the last 20, 30 years, how has this occurred? What's actually triggered this? And he said, often the trigger is some sort of change, some sort of problem. And in his case, he said, often in this case, it was that there was a secondary pest or they had, were putting in bumblebees in the early days uh, to actually make efficient pollination. And in order to have their bumblebees working properly, they needed to think differently about how they were farming. So there's usually some sort of trigger that allows someone to think actually slightly differently to perhaps the classical um, or historical methods. I apologize, the figure here is um, actually incorrect, it's a bit lower than this, but when you come into the outdoor crops, the uh, vineyards, then it's a higher percentage, um, really between sort of 10, 20 in terms of uh, pheromones and use of biocontrol technologies. Uh, but really what's, what's important here is that the change, the, the different way of approach is, is happening already and it's happening on a, on a big scale. It's not all there, but they're very, very strong um, areas. And that's, I'll come to that uh, later on in my talk. When we look maybe at arable crops, and I think this is again a little bit um, what Eric touched on, it's, it's a slightly different system in terms of uh, the growth, often it's monoculture based on uh, uh, operational efficiency. And there, it takes a bit more to move to a more biocontrol and more integrated um, approach. But transition is happening, and there are examples, and uh, I'll come to a, a few of those as we go forward. Okay, so, just to sort of summarise that bit, if you like, look at the status of sort of biocontrol and alternatives and their uptake is more advanced in horticulture than arable. And I kind of think of it a bit like a traffic light. And I think, well, when we look at protected cropping, it's going pretty well. There's always improvements that can be made. Um, but I'd say it's, it's normal, normal practice. When you move outdoors, move into vines, for example, there are many good examples, but I would describe it as work in progress. There's, there's much more work to be done. In arable, I would say that there are some good examples, um, but I think there's a lot of work to do. So just coming now to a few uh, quotes around farmer examples where we've got from their experience in pheromone development uh, in, uh, in vineyards. So an example, and this is uh, thanks to the um, videos and, uh, and interviews done uh, by Pan and um, and IBMA members. And here, when you look at uh, Luxembourg, then many of the uh, IPM uh, practices are actually have, have moved to uh, almost 100%, and in fact, uh, an area of uh, over 1,000 um, hectares is actually covered by pheromones. And they conclude when you talk to farmers, they actually don't need their insecticides anymore in, uh, in, in here. In Switzerland, slightly lower um, percentage, but uh, obviously a bigger area. Um, but here, what they're observing, and this is an important aspect of moving to alternatives, is that, that in attacks in the, that's pest attacks, pest attacks in the vineyards are always lower where they've been able to use pheromones um, or mating disruption. Um, and uh, they're always lower than in the conventional uh, practices showing that when you actually start on a more alternative approach and biocontrol um, technologies, you're able to build on the biology. So the biology builds on the biology. And when you're first starting out, you're not able to use that benefit. But as it progresses, you're able to use that more and more. Then perhaps looking at IPM at more of a landscape scale, and uh, here where we've actually got companies all working together and uh, large um, buyers 
um, they are able to actually all work together. Um, and then one starts to have one a bigger area, um, but also able to get um, much more uh, consistent control. And you're starting to see integrated practices really at a, at a landscape level. And it's interesting to note this is an example from Vines, but you say a very, very similar approach in apples with similar amounts and areas that are under that uh, level of control. Uh, coming to, to Arable, okay. I think Arable we've talked about, but it, again, and I think um, previous uh, speakers talked about this, and I'm sure there'll be some more uh, discussion later on about it, um, but there's some very good uh, demonstrations in, uh, in many countries uh, where this is actually working, the DEFI farms in, in France. And I think what I'd say is despite the national picture, um, which was very, very well explained by uh, Florence, there are points where this is um, successful and has been a successful uh, transition in arable. And often it's combined with thinking again about the tolerance level, what's your threshold for, for working with a particular um, control technique, and also um, looking at your whole agricultural system that allows you then to manage your profit. And I think in this uh, case, uh, this uh, farmer, as is often the case, they're often either doing better than average or um, are just as uh, profitable under their IPM programs. And we have several examples um, of that. The other aspect is that it allows flexibility in uh, planning of the operations. Okay, so in terms of uh, what have we learned, and I think there's some previous um, uh, speakers have actually talked a bit about this. But the importance of farmer-to-farmer -farmer networks, of farmer-to-farmer -farmer learning, um, and uh, in our uh, work in IBMA France, then the survey sort of talked about uh, seeing what the neighbour was doing or looking over the hedge, um, and that's actually quite an important aspect. Uh, and Helene talked about that in terms of farmers' measures of success. You know, is my field looking as good as the guy next door? And what's he doing or she doing? Um, this need for a trigger, and why change? There needs to be something happening on your farm or something happening in your business that makes a need to start to make a change. There are often multiple actors that can help and ensuring that those actors work with uh, the farmers themselves, whether they be advisors or researchers or companies. And overridingly, we find that it does work. Biocontrol does work. In the, but you have to be patient and you have to work with the system. So... It's a reality. How do we accelerate the uptake? One aspect is certainly the proportionate regulation, which is important from um, ensuring that we have more products on the market faster. Helping farmers to share best practice. That's a, a key aspect of allowing farmers to, to learn and to, and to change. Why change unless uh, there's a good reason and someone's shown you that, it, that it's working? Um, and then financial incentives always help if you're taking a risk. And any change in any business is a risk. And therefore, some sort of incentive to help manage that is very helpful. I just wanted to end on a quote. This is from an American farmer in North Dakota called Gabe Brown, who some of you may know, may have seen in, uh, I think he's got a TED talk and the like, and wrote a book called Dirt to Soil. But he talks about biological life um, is a force, and once you unleash it, it will continue to grow and generate new life. And I think that is the essence of how IPM works. The more you're able to start at the bottom of that triangle, the more you're able to use the agronomy, the more you're able to use the biolog biological techniques, the more they build and the more they improve the way the next biological technique works. So it's actually a fundamental way of thinking that allows you to develop these alternatives. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you for this, uh, this global view now. Now, uh, I think uh, the organizer are forced to address, I think, the most challenging issue. Uh, to reduce pesticide is a challenge. To reduce fungicide is, from all point of view, quite a, a bigger even challenge. And obviously, uh, if we speak about uh, sustainable agriculture, this also has to be addressed. And as Florence uh, 
And uh, the previous speaker tell us that the, uh, at the beginning things are happening on the field. And there is farmers who are trying to do their best working on that. And we are glad to have three of them uh, together uh, here for explaining what they are <laughs> What, what they are doing, what they are fighting, what they are trying on their own farm. And I think they are coming from three different countries. Uh, I speak about uh, country and not member state, because I don't know if UK is still a country or is still a member state or what is, but well, it's a real farmer. And uh, Alex, Alex is, is, a, is, is a real farmer coming from today, still a, a, a real member state. <laughs> And personally, I hope we continue to be a member of the family during, during many years. We have also Paolo Mosca, Italian, who will uh, come here. And we have Jean-François Monod, French one, who will present their experience. Please come, come join me in... Uh... Ah. OK. <laughs> Second mistake of the day. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a bad guy, huh? I'm not a bad guy, <laughs> but Henriette, Henriette has to take the, want to take, and I'm sure will very interestingly take the floor. <laughs> so, thank you. So, yeah, I wanted to, we talk about the, the triangle, but I just wanted to highlight a little bit. We would have loved to le le make a mapping of showing good economic practices all over Europe, so more focus on the basis of the triangle. But there is no recent EU statistic on economic practices like cover crops, crop rotation, so it's difficult to do at this stage. There is no EU statistic on non-crop vegetation, uptake of hedges, buffers, etc. And there is not even any pesticide statistic on use that is recent. So trying to do a mapping on economic, good economic practices and spread it to other people or to other areas is very difficult to do. We do have a lot of, we are starting to get better on the statistic on organic. And as Isabel Lang was saying before, th there's very few organic growers in some sectors. We have to start pushing them forward and, and give the example for other but how to follow. But for the moment, EU is not there. I think, I think it's for, it will be for iPhone to do that job. So, what happened yesterday was that the European Commission, they launched the EU Green Deal. I am probably the most disappointed person in Brussels today because all of the promises on pesticides are out. So there's not much positive to say, only one thing, and it is that it, it does recognise that we need to monitor and report more. So we can hope that this, that very soon we will start doing this monitoring exercise so that we in the future can start talking about, you know, start to have this mapping of, of, of alternatives, of how to do it. So I was trying to, to see what is it that we then know. There's no EU statistics, so what is it that we then do have? And we do have some report from the audit uh, unit of DG Sante. And what they say about statistics is that few member states, they do collect information about <coughs> statistics. So in Holland, they do record every year what are the rotations that the farmers are doing. So that's a very good example. In Ireland, they have done uh, a study last year, for instance, where they are saying that farmers are doing a rotation, but they don't speci specify which rotation. So we, of course, as PEN, we would like not only to know what kind of rotation, what if they are doing rotation, but also what kind of rotation, because for us, that is what makes the whole difference. Um, what we are also seeing in this audit report, which are very interesting, is that we would expect that after, with the implementation of sustainable use directive, member states would be promoting the concept of crop rotation. But what is happening, at least according to these two reports from Denmark and Sweden, is that the rotation is actually becoming wor have become worse over time, not best. So we are not really on the right track. So. IBMA and PAN and IOBC, we are starting to collect farmers' examples. And these are the kind of farmers' examples that we are collecting. So you see, yeah, these are, very, uh, these are the kind of, of people that we are also inviting. He, uh, uh, Jean Banahi was here to speak a couple of years ago. Now we hope that we can also add the examples that we will <laughs> listen in two minutes so that we keep on collecting the good examples that we are 
showing, to show another model and to show that it is possible to work with nature and to make a living of it. Uh, but it, it takes a... We, you are here to inspire. So I will not take your time, but we are definitely in process. We are far away from being able to do any sexual and geographical mapping on which can inspire others to get started. So, and we are light years away from starting to, dis to, to talk about which rotation. I mean, so I would say that what we have to do is that if we want to go towards a toxic free environment, definitely what we have to do is give much more focus on the statistics. We have to give, show the statistics. Um, yeah, we have to try to put farming practices into the EU statistic agendas, which we don't do in general. We have to put it in any kind of revision or reform of any policy coming in the very near future, which is revision of the sustainable use directive and reform of the cap. Because if we don't have more statistics about farming practices or about pesticide use, we are simply unable to start bridging the gap between citizens and farmers. Uh, Florence was saying it that, that there's more and more citizens opposition to the way we are farming right now. And it is time we start to get a little bit more nerdy. I mean, we start to say, this is good and this is bad. I mean, so I think it is really important that we start focusing. We start focusing also on, we, we start being able to start, these are the good practices, what is Jennifer was explaining about pheromones, and this is what we are trying to see is being multiplied somewhere else. So, and finally, it will also be very important to try we need to know more so we can finally be able to assist the farmers in the change that they need. And therefore, that we uh, move towards <laughs> the progress on non-toxic environment. For too long, we've been focusing on fighting nature. Now it is time we start working with nature. So that was my... I hope I was, I was quick. I was quick. That's almost... Always. Thank you. So nice. th that, was my that was my contribution. Thank you. <laughs> You were quick, nice, and smiling, <laughs> as usual. Okay, can I now ask our farmer friends to <coughs> come with me? <coughs> Donc, nos, nos, nos amis agriculteurs qui viennent. Uh... Ah, non, bah. Okay. Yeah. I shall go. I shall go here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, I propose to follow the order in the in the list I have uh, in my in my in my paper. Alex. Yes, it's me. Uh, actually. Alex, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Third mistake of the day. <laughs> Okay, apologize. Okay. <laughs> I, I was supposing Alex was a man, but uh, apparently you are. Oh, you, no, you are. Okay, apparently you, you, you are not. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Unless something change overnight. But, uh... <laughs> okay, Alex, please. Okay, um, I did the um, the buzzer for the Other slides, thing. please. Would it work from here? Okay. I think so. Let's see. Let's see. Well, bonjour, madame et monsieur. Je suis trop honorée d'être ici. And this is far as my French will go, I'm afraid. Um, I'm Italian by origin, as my name states, is Alessandra Valsecchi, but uh, I've been in England for uh, nearly half of my life. And I'm here to bring you something probably a bit unusual. Viticulture in UK is a nonsense, it's still a nonsense, but we're fighting through and we're making it a successful business. So I'm taking you through what has been my journey in these uh, 25 years of growing vines uh, all throughout uh, Europe and not just Europe. After specializing in Milan uh, in fruit culture and viticulture, 
you get absorbed by science and you think everything has got to have a systematic approach to life. I moved then to UK where I worked for a worldwide organization called the Royal Horticultural Society and there I had the chance to embrace more of organic growing and uh, uh, organic practice. Whilst there, I travel around the globe. I went to New Zealand, emerging country in viticulture, and uh, understood how things should be actually done a bit better. For then uh, completing my career, and I hope I will uh, still be at Albury for uh, a little while longer, although my hands start to suffer years of pruning, so early retirement might come on the scene. But, um, we believe we might have achieved something called harmony, but we'll see to that. So once you come out of university and you have science in your head, everything you think is to do things in a systematic approach because it's much easier. It's much easier you treat everything like the same and uh, you grow things in line to start with, not just because they look neat and tidy, but it is easy to operate in lines and you treat the first vine of the first row like the last one of the last row. Nevertheless, uh, they're probably not the same in their development. And you use broad spec chemicals because, again, it makes life easy, especially when you have to deal with a field as large as the big estate of uh, vines uh, in the top left-hand corner. And uh, time is money at the end of the day. So money is a big factor involved in what we do. And it will always will be, I do believe. Also, you work in a systematic approach, perhaps not in such a great extent like the uh, big uh, uh, vineyard, but in smaller uh, parcels of land, uh, like the other two pictures, they actually represent the north of Italy. As you know about our topography in the north of Italy, extremely hard, hush to grow. So farmers always looked at an easy way to fight solution. And uh, chemicals were the easy way to fight solution because it's already blooming hard to try to work on these slopes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, have to fuss around with things. When I came to England, I was uh, uh, at uh, the RHS Wisley for uh, 10 years. Uh, Wisley as an organization is to be seen, uh, the RHS as an organization has to be seen as a, uh, as a charitable society, but its uh, main aims are education, and is education for uh, the professional as well as for the amateurs, so everybody around us, the consumers as such, is also innovation. So they look at it, um, innovative techniques on how to do things better. And uh, is main fundamentally is preserve, conserve what we have, generally under the point of view of uh, the diversity that the horticultural world offer in terms of varieties, in terms of cultivars. And uh, there um, we planted this little vineyard that you saw in the previous slide with the idea of showing the public and the growers that you could actually grow vines, believe it or not, in UK, despite the climatic condition, and you could do it in an organic way. And the best things to do is obviously started with disease-resistant variety. And this is where genetic comes into place. Uh, disease-resistant variety can come by nature or can come by hybridization or because we have been helping them to achieve this uh, um, resistance. And uh, integrate pest management follow to that. Obviously, there were directives uh, um, established in 2009, but Wisley and the RHS were already adopting the integrate pest management long before that. Whilst at Wisley, I had the chance uh, to explore the world of alternative uh, um, products, and uh, biological control was uh, up there with many other forms, but we use biological control in all sorts of uh, crops, not just the vines. We use biological control in greenhouses for strawberries under protection. So two of the big pests of strawberries are uh, red spider mites and uh, thrips, and aphids also, I include uh, on this, so three of them. And these pests, uh, they have the uh, ability of uh, 
producing several generations through a year and uh, therefore become resistant to pretty much any product that you try to spray on them. So they have uh, this power. And the only way to really fight them or keep them under control is to introduce a pest for them. And this is where biocontrol was, uh, um, gave extraordinary results, both undercover and in the open. Also, we experimented biological control on apples. Apples uh, suffer of uh, several pests. Uh, the big part of the pest is probably underlined with the word of moths, so hold the tortrix line. And uh, with the combination of trapping, so monitoring, and the use of the biological control called bacillus thuringiensis, which has been on the scene for quite a long time, this is a predator that basically kill the caterpillar form of the moth. And to be honest with you, it probably kills them in quite a pretty brutal way because uh, the moth feeds on the greenery, the bacillus entered the stomach of the moth and just killed the moth from the, the, the caterpillar from inside out. Now I'll probably be rather much sprayed off with some kind of insecticide and collapse straight away, the, the, you know, going through some torture. But it's definitely better for the rest of the environment uh, using bacillus thuringiensis, their organophosphate. Uh, by the end of my life at Weasley, we had cut down dramatically in the use of insecticide. I think we were almost down to probably one application a year, which is quite successful when you think you're dealing with a collection of apples, not just the orchard or maybe two or three varieties. With the vines, we had obviously planted disease-resistant varieties, so we didn't have the issue of uh, um, of, of, of the worry of the main diseases, which are obviously powdery and downy mildew and botrytis. But botrytis was not part of the resistance of uh, um, the variety. So we had to start to uh, use biological control for that. And with that, we used Bacillus subtilis. Whilst there, I went through to New Zealand and I really found that there everything is a bit more harmonious. It's harmonious because they haven't been bombarding their land with pesticide like we perhaps we've done in Europe, and they've used our mistake to improve their growing techniques and focusing more on how we can all survive together. So companion planting to attract beneficial insects. New Zealand is one of the best ground to trial new biological control. The great study on trichoderma is coming from them. I finally arrived at Oldbury, and uh, that's where I've been for the last 10 years. Uh, Oldbury is one of 600 vineyards in the UK, and uh, we're all mad because you're thinking vines are plants that were designed in the Mediterranean, they enjoy being in the sunshine, and what we got is the grey sky of London. So how can you grow successfully these crops? Well, you have to let them be their own, in their own environment, yes, but if you let nature take a course, so we're not growing anymore a monoculture of vines, but we grow a multiple culture where we use other plants to support the vines. So we embrace biodynamic, which for you probably doesn't mean very much, but for the ones that they don't, you know, they don't know what biodynamic means, uh, is a little bit like a homeopathic remedy we plants for plants. So we use plant extract to supply the vines uh, with nutrient, and uh, we allow anything else that is not a vine to grow amongst the vines because they can be a source of beneficial for the vines. And I'm not just mean just the pretty insects that they represented in the pictures, so all the ladybirds, the butterflies, and so on. When I'm talking about beneficial, I'm talking about beneficial at soil level, because if your roots are solid, then the plant is stronger, and a stronger plant can fight off disease much better. So we're focusing a lot in improving soil, in improving the microorganisms in the soil, all these symbiotic fungi that they leave with the root system, and they support the root system, and they're for the all of the plant. But that, of course, is not enough. There are big problems in growing vines in a very humid country, uh, powdering down in mildew, but botrytis is the greatest problem. So they rot onto the fruit, where the picture might not show, but they look 
quite clean fruit. And we've always been delivering clean fruit because we used the Bacillus subtilis as the main form of biological control against botrytis. And if we can do it, I do believe that even my fellow colleagues, that they just work with conventional product, they can do it. Now, biodynamic also involves a lot of uh, working with the moon phases. And yes, I will continue to dance uh, once the full moon na naked around the vines uh, to catch the bad spirits, but the rest has to come to you, from you. The support has to come from you. They invest in this business to give us more tools uh, to fight problems that otherwise we probably overtake the final result of enjoying a nice bottle of wine, not just the full moon, but hopefully in the sunshine. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope I've been quick and sharp. Thank you, thank you, Alex. For a Spaniard, seeing how wine is growing in, and good wine is growing in, thank you. in, in the United Kingdom is really a challenge. And, uh, well, it's life and uh, it's climate change, perhaps, also. Please, I, I think, Paolo, Buongiorno a tutti. Per un agricoltore vi do il tempo di mettervi le cuffie, il mio intervento sarà in italiano. Per un agricoltore come me è un'occasione straordinaria poter venire a confrontarmi in una sede così importante su tematiche che riguardano il mio futuro e riguardano così da vicino. Viviamo un momento veramente strategico per il futuro della nostra agricoltura. Le tematiche che sono state dibattute, io ho preso tantissimi appunti e spero che ci si possa confrontare dopo perché ci sono tantissime cose su cui disquisire. Io vi parlerò della mia esperienza, io sono un coltivatore di riso italiano nel nord ovest d'Italia, nella pianura vercellese. Parto subito parlandovi del problema del riso, eh, delle problematiche del riso che maggiormente riscontrano eh, quello di cui si parla oggi, cioè l'attacco fungino o la, le problematiche della gestione, nella gestione di insetti. Eh, in Italia abbiamo eh, numerosi istituti di ricerca, questa è una pubblicazione del, dell'ente nazionale Risi, che è l'ente che maggiormente si occupa di ricerca e sviluppo eh, sulla, sulla risicoltura, che parla ormai ad ogni uscita di problematiche legate al controllo della malattia fungina e in particolar modo della pericularia e, della, eh, e di insetti eh, che compromettono la produzione. Vi ricordo che la pericularia eh, quello che viene conosciuto come Blast è responsabile della maggior parte della perdita di produzione eh, in risicoltura in tutte le aree temperate del, del globo, con clima temperato del globo. Provoca delle, eh, delle necrosi, delle bruciature a livello di lamina fogliare e delle necrosi a livello del colletto della pannocchia eh, che portano appunto una perdita di produzione. L'altro aspetto sul quale oggi, di cui oggi vi parlo è del controllo di questo fastidiosissimo insetto di origine asiatica. Devo parlare più piano. Quando parlo di una cosa che mi piace mi lascio, mi lascio un po' trascinare. <ride> questo insetto di origine asiatica che sta creando non pochi problemi alla, alla risicoltura. Bene, eh, la gestione di, questi, eh, di, questi, di queste problematiche in risicoltura normalmente con l'approccio convenzionale viene gestito attraverso al primo posto normalmente tra gli agricoltori trova posto il controllo chimico quello è il primo strumento a cui un agricoltore fa riferimento ci sono poi interventi di tipo biologico quindi con l'utilizzo di varietà eh, maggiormente resistenti che tollano maggiormente l'infezione fungina e poi ci sono i più moderni sistemi di monitoraggio su questo aspetto ci sono eh, diversi progetti che, che fanno i monitoraggi delle spore che vengono diffuse nell'ambiente e quindi possono eh, prevedere le infezioni future. Questo è un tipo di approccio che è stato ampiamente studiato. Vi ricordo che l'Italia è il primo produttore europeo di riso. È stato ampiamente studiato dal punto di vista della sostenibilità, sostenibilità economica. Nella diapositiva che, sto, che ho proiettato, nell'immagine ehm, nell a sinistra, si vede questa pubblicazione che è il bilancio economico dell'azienda risicola. Questo viene stilato da, ehm, 
l'ordine dei dottori agronomi della provincia di Vercelli e questo studio eh, fotografa e restituisce una dimensione della sostenibilità economica dell'impresa risicola secondo il modello che vi ho descritto prima, cioè quello al primo posto chemical control, biological control, il model e il monitor, quello convenzionale. Benissimo, questo studio certifica che la, 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 la resa media ad ettaro dell'azienda risicola è di 6.5 tonnellate ad ettaro e andando molto velocemente, questo è uno studio del 2017, potete, potete scaricarlo, andando molto velocemente questo studio concludeva dicendo che cosa? Che il break even point, il punto di rientro di quel tipo di azienda con quel tipo di impostazione su diverse dimensioni aziendali, 50, 150, 300 ettari, su diversi anni, quindi anche con differente apporto di eh, politiche di sostegno comunitario, sapete che stanno andando via via decrescendo, Beh, nel punto di rientro si arrivava vicino al punto di rientro solo con le aziende di 300 ettari. E questo certifica immediatamente, restituisce immediatamente la dimensione del problema, dove ci troviamo in una realtà con aziende di 100, 150 ettari, io un'azienda di 130 ettari e questo impone delle, delle riflessioni e anche un problema sociale oltre che di sostenibilità economica. Bene, io e altri miei colleghi eh, fortemente preoccupati, veramente preoccupati dal futuro della nostra risicoltura, ci siamo trovati, di fronti, ci siamo trovati a ricercare un nuovo modello di sviluppo eh, che tenesse in conto tenesse conto di tutti i, i goal che nel frattempo ci venivano offerti, per esempio quelli dell'Agenda 2030 e altri stimoli. Eh, ci sono gli aspetti economici che vi ho descritto, ma ci sono anche gli aspetti di output ambientale che vi ho descritto. L'ente per la gestione della qualità delle acque del nostro territorio certificava una situazione di degrado delle, delle acque superficiali e profonde dovute proprio alla contaminazione da fitofarmaci. Questo ha portato un nuovo modello di eh, ci siamo inventati un nuovo modello di, ehm, di, di, di ricerca rispetto al modello passato quello che ha caratterizzato la rivoluzione industriale la rivoluzione verde scusate dove la ricerca e lo sviluppo erano eh, centralizzate e organizzate e i, i agricoltori erano gli utilizzatori finali di questo tipo di, eh, di approccio eh, top down eh, bene noi abbiamo cercato di mettere in piedi un eh, differente approccio eh, metodologico, cioè quello dal basso, dove ehm, la creazione del, e l'evoluzione delle conoscenze vengono gestite in autonomia e in sinergia, in un approccio integrato con chi fa ricerca, con chi lavora sul campo, con chi eh, migliora e con chi sviluppa. Questo eh, modello, rispetto a quello che vi ho descritto prima, è, una, è un modello che mette le conoscenze, le capacità al centro eh, dell'azione eh, migliorativa, mentre invece il modello precedente, quello che abbiamo vissuto nella passata epoca, è un modello che metteva la tecnologia e che veniva poi passata. Bene, in un progetto, in un progetto mh, che ha visto la, ehm, la partecipazione di diverse aziende del territorio, eh, siamo riusciti ad avere un, una diversa chiave di lettura della risicoltura attraverso l'agroecologia semplicemente, quindi la, la risicoltura biologica attraverso la, la agroecologia. Che cosa abbiamo lavorato? Abbiamo lavorato sulle conoscenze che sono la prima cosa, sulla biodiversità e qui ci sono le varietà, riscoprire varietà che abbiano una risposta interessante in questo senso e lavoriamo tantissimo sulla salute del suolo. Un suolo in salute è un suolo che ci restituisce una produzione eh, di qualità e una, una produzione diversa. Questo lo otteniamo attraverso un pacchetto di pratiche agronomiche, la parola agronomia è la, è la parola più importante di questo percorso, che passa attraverso un suolo che viene eh, normalmente coperto da cover crop, ehm, uso di, di, di cover crop per creare la riserva di azoto necessaria, la rotazione, le minimum tillage e falsa semina. Eh, questo è il, il tipo di risposta che abbiamo dato all'infezione fungina, cioè attraverso una rotazione delle colture che ha creato un bilancio scientifico dell'apporto azotato. Eh, L'apporto azotato è, è strategico nella prevenzione dell'infezione dell fungina, questo ci ha permesso di 
eh, controllare, eh, controllare questo primo problema. Il secondo problema che ci è stato permesso di controllare grazie a un ambiente più complesso, una, una agrobiodiversità, cioè un ambiente veramente eh, diversificato all'interno del quale trova spazio una, una complessità ecologica. Questa è una zona di 11 ettari che abbiamo all'interno della nostra azienda dove trova spazio diverse comunità eh, st la stessa gestione dei perimetri e dei fossati dove vengono seminate delle specie per poter dare eh, riparo, dare eh, ristoro a eh, comunità diverse da quelle della, eh, che vengono comunemente intese all'interno di un areale agricolo. Questa è una, è una diapositiva molto semplificata che però rende bene la differenza tra un, tra un, un ecosistema semplificato e un ecosistema complesso e vi, per, vi prego di guardare questo video di 50 secondi per farvi capire e poi mi avvio alle conclusioni. Qua si può vedere con un colpo d'occhio molto semplice una gestione biologica, come potete vedere alla mia destra, dove c'è biodiversità. Ok, eh, in questa immagine eh, faccio prima perché sennò ci vuole troppo tempo, nella parte di destra la gestione agroecologica sono tutti ambienti di risaia, nella parte di sinistra un mio vicino di nome Antonio che, pratica, che è un buon agricoltore, un buon risicoltore e eh, gestisce la, la sua risaia eh, secondo eh, questa, 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 questa piramide ma con una visione di questa piramide leggermente diversa da quella che invece eh, voglio proporre io. Eh, questo è un modello semplificato di gestione, mentre invece in quello di, sinistra, in quello di destra si vede un qualcosa di diverso che può veramente rendere, eh, far capire qual è la complessità sulla quale si va a, a lavorare. Se mi rimetti la diapositiva? Ah, sia dal punto di vista del campo coltivato, con diverse specie, un misco. No, no, diapositiva. Scusate, solo che i video, non so perché, su, questa, su questi software non girano, non si riescono mai a... Bene, passo ai risultati. I risultati sono stati innanzitutto un risultato di cui vado molto orgoglioso, cioè una pubblicazione scientifica su una rivista eh, di portata eh, molto importante, che è Agricultural System, che parta, parla proprio di questo approccio partecipato di miglioramento della... Eh, del, modello, del modello di risicoltura. L altra, l altra, il contraltare di, questo, di questa pubblicazione è stata l'adozione di tecniche eh, di agricoltura eh, conservativa, di agricoltura biologica che mi hanno permesso di ottenere una produzione. Qui eh, vedete la semina diretta delle cover crop, e lo sviluppo delle cover crop, l'utilizzo dei pascoli, tutte cose che erano state dimenticate, abbandonate, e anzi mai praticate nella risicoltura convenzionale. La semina diretta al, sopra la cover crop della coltura risicola, eh, la raccolta di un riso che arrivo a, a produrre essendo libero al 100% la dipendenza da fitofarmaci, che è un aspetto assolutamente importante e fondamentale. E la, la media di produzione è di 5,6 tonnellate per il 2019, una tonnellata in meno rispetto alla media degli ultimi 15 anni della risicoltura convenzionale. Una tonnellata è tanto e poco. Mi chiedo, all'alba del 2020, eh, l'efficienza di un'azienda agricola si misura soltanto in tonnellate ad ettaro o anche negli output che questa eh, differenza porta in termini ambientali, in termini sociali. Concludo dicendovi questo, che il cambiamento in risicoltura è possibile, ci sono diversi strumenti per arrivare a questo, a questo cambiamento, la conoscenza, rimettere la conoscenza alle mani dell'agricoltore affinché egli stesso possa scegliere quali strumenti utilizzare per poter essere artefice egli stesso del proprio cambiamento è fondamentale e i risultati dal punto di vista economico la, produce un po' meno la produzione biologica, ma produce non una commodities ma una specialities, un qualcosa che va a incontrare un bisogno sempre crescente del mercato europeo ed internazionale, una sostenibilità sociale, perché vi ho detto prima che la, la, il break-even point, eh, gli specialisti lo fissavano su un'azienda da 300 ettari, essendo la terra un bene limitato capite perfettamente che se la media attuale è 100 ettari significa che dovranno sparire due aziende per far posto eh, a una. E questa è sostenibilità sociale, lasciare le, le aziende eh, lavorare sul proprio territorio e una, una sostenibilità ambientale, beh questo non ve lo so neanche a ripetere. Concludo dicendo che sono stato due giorni a, questo, a questa conferenza, l'Agri la, Outlook, 
e tutte le cose, tutti gli output usciti dal nostro, dal nostro gruppo di lavoro, da questo modello di ricerca partecipata, vengono ripresi eh, in, modo, in modo insistente, in modo sistematico eh, da, eh, dal panel, sono stati ripresi in modo sistematico dal panel eh, sulle produzioni sostenibili, questo mi dà eh, modo di pensare che siamo sulla strada giusta. Non vi racconto questo perché l'ho sentito dire, ma perché lo faccio, e anzi vi invito a venirmi a trovare per darvi prova di quanto vi ho detto. Grazie. Grazie, grazie Paolo. Grazie Paolo. Je, je passe maintenant la parole a Jean-François Monod. Vous avez, vous avez remarqué qu'on nous a dit que les, les, les traitements en, en plein champ étaient beaucoup plus difficiles à, à, à aborder que les expériences qu'on nous présente sont justement des, des expériences de plein champ, ce qui démontre l'intérêt énorme de, 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 de l'approche et, et, et la grande complexité des, des, des moyens mis en œuvre. Jean-François Merci. Je vous remercie déjà de, de me permettre de m'exprimer sur ce sujet, un sujet qui est, qui est important pour l'agriculture et pour le métier d'agriculteur. Et je voulais vous, vous dire au préalable qu'il y a une réelle vo volonté donc des, des agriculteurs à trouver des alternatives euh, aux produits phyto. Donc je suis agriculteur euh, et je suis bien conscient de ces enjeux. Donc mon témoignage va porter sur euh, les pratiques réelles faites sur le terrain, sur mon exploitation. Alors dans un premier temps, je vais euh, vous présenter mon exploitation sa stratégie, puis vous exposer donc les méthodes alternatives aux produits phytosanitaires que je mets en place et ensuite ses objectifs. Ensuite, je ferai un focus euh, sur le blé dur. Le blé dur est une culture qu'on cultive beaucoup par, euh, dans, le, dans le sud de la France. Et euh, je vous mettrai en face donc, des, des, des limites de ce système. Et puis en conclusion, euh, on fera un bond en avant de 10 ans pour voir un petit peu comment va, j'imagine, mon exploitation dans 10 ans. Donc voilà, je, je me localise à, enfin, de la, mon exploitation se situe euh, donc à Castelnaudary, dans le, dans le sud de la France. J'ai une, une surface de 125 hectares, donc en sol argilo calcaire et irrigable. Donc c'est quelque chose d'intéressant et d'important de dire que c'est irrigable, parce que le fait d'irriguer euh, nous permet de pouvoir, comme vous le voyez ensuite, euh, avoir une diversité des, des cultures. Sans irrigation, euh, la moitié, même les, 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 les deux tiers de ce qui est inscrit là, euh, on ne pourrait, euh, pourrait pas le cultiver. Donc qu'est-ce qu'on a On a du blé dur pour 40 hectares, du blé tendre pour 10 hectares, de l'orge, du maïs, de la chia, et ensuite une spécialité en semences potagères. Donc euh, beaucoup de légumineuses, enfin quelques légumineuses et des semences potagères. Donc c'est ça qui, voilà, un peu le... le je, je, donc je travaille là-dessus, donc sur cette, euh, sur cette diversité, diversité culturelle qui permet, on va le voir par la suite, de pouvoir mettre en place euh, des systèmes de, de biocontrôle et euh, de, de réduire les, les produits phytosanitaires. Donc voilà la stratégie sur mon, ex, mon, mon exploitation. Donc il y a une stratégie de développement durable. Donc pour être en accord donc avec, avec cette durabilité, cette stratégie de durabilité, j'ai mis en place une certification sur l'exploitation. C'est une certification ISO 14000. Alors, je ne sais pas si, si ça vous parle, c'est du management environnemental. C'est une certification mondiale. Bon, il y a peu d'exploitations en France euh, qui sont certifiées là, mais qui, de, qui donne un regard un peu extérieur. Donc il y a un groupe qui est autour de cette, de cette certification et qui nous donne les outils, qui nous oblige à avoir des, euh, des indicateurs. Et comme comme ça, on connaît notre marge de progrès, on sait où on va aller. Donc, ensuite, il faut l'appliquer sur l'exploitation. Donc, il y a un premier angle, c'est l'angle économique. Donc, là-dessus, euh, donc 125 hectares, donc euh, des cultures diversifiées, donc à forte valeur ajoutée. Donc, qui dit forte valeur ajoutée, dit un angle social, la main d'œuvre. Il y a 4 ETP, donc moi je suis, euh, je suis exploitant, j'ai un salarié permanent et ensuite euh, divers saisonniers pour, pouvoir, euh, pour travailler sur l'exploitation. Et le troisième volet, qui est aussi très important, c'est l'angle environnemental. Donc là, on privilégie les, la réduction de l'engrange chimique. Il faut bien comprendre dans cette stratégie de, de développement durable que c'est un triptyque qui doit être assez égal. Donc si par exemple l'angle économique 
n'est plus là, donc ben, certainement que l'angle social ne va pas suivre, et en même temps l'angle environnemental et tout ça. Donc on essaye d'avancer sur ce système-là, euh, de, de mener à bien ces trois, euh, ces trois orientations euh, si simultanément. Je voulais vous, vous dire aussi qu'il y a une large partie du revenu de l'agriculteur euh, qui se fait en multipliant un prix par un rendement. Sur le prix, il n'y a pas de levier. C'est du marché mondial, sur ce qu'on a vu sur mon exploitation. Les grandes cultures, donc le blé, l'orge, le blé tendre, etc., on est sur du prix mondial. Le riz aussi, on est essentiellement sur des prix mondiaux. Euh, le deuxième levier, levier est le, enfin, le deuxième objectif de, de, de le rendement, donc un prix par un rendement, c'est le rendement. Donc l'agriculteur peut euh, travailler que sur ce rendement. Donc on va, mettre en chose, on va mettre en place des choses pour pouvoir maintenir, pour pouvoir augmenter ce rendement. Donc là, on va regarder quelles sont les possibilités de pouvoir avoir ce seul levier euh, sur lequel on peut, on peut jouer. Donc sur mon exploitation, moi c'est voilà, 50% sur ce rendement et l'autre partie euh, sur les cultures euh, semencières. Donc là, tout est contractualisé, tout est écrit. Donc c'est-à-dire qu'on connaît déjà à la base le rendement de, de la culture et son prix. Et ce qui donne un, une une appréhension sur l'avenir qui est quand même beaucoup plus simple et beaucoup plus fiable euh, parce qu'on sait où on va. Donc voilà le déploiement en fait des, des méthodes alternatives que je mets en place sur, euh, sur l'exploitation donc pour bien sûr réduire les produits euh, phytosanitaires. Donc déjà des, des, des rotations longues, on l'a vu, beaucoup de cultures, donc ce qui nous permet euh, d'avoir des alternatives et de, de, de tourner ces, ces cultures. Ensuite, euh, l'alternative euh, sur les désherbants, c'est bien sûr sur les équipements mécaniques. Donc RC3, vibroculteuse, binose guidée. Donc on a euh, tout un système qui nous permet euh, de baisser et de ne presque plus, dans certains cas, utiliser euh, de, de désherbants sur, sur les cultures. Et euh, la biodiversité fonctionnelle, alors ça c'est quelque chose de très important, on l'a vu sur, sur les attaques euh, d'agresseurs, de, 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 de bioagresseurs, donc ça, les jachères mielifères, les haies, remettre un peu de bocage dans les exploitations, euh, travailler euh, sur, euh, sur, voilà, sur, sur tout ça, permet d'avoir une biodiversité qui est là et avoir des, des, des auxiliaires de culture naturellement. Et ça, euh, on le voit et on voit que ça marche marche extrêmement bien. Alors, on voit rapidement donc sur les sur les cultures ce qui est euh, ce qui est en place. Hein, donc, grosso modo, on voit que les méthodes alternatives déployées sont essentiellement les dates de semis, les faux semis et euh, tout le travail du sol. Euh, un petit peu, voilà, euh, en maïs, on utilise déjà les trichogrammes, c'est quelque chose qui fonctionne très bien contre la pyrale du maïs. Et par contre, hein, voilà, les maladies non contrôlées, euh, c'est tout ce qui va être fongicide. Euh, on va parler du cas du blé dur, mais par exemple sur l'oignon, euh, le mildiou et le botrytis, c'est quelque chose, donc là on est sur culture de, de semences, culture sous contrat, et quelque chose qui est donc à la base hein, de, de l'exploitation et qui fait aussi le, voilà, le, le développement de l'exploitation, et qui est très très difficile à contrôler. Donc si vous voulez, il y a, donc on met en place aussi des OAD. On a parlé de tout à l'heure d'outils d'aide à la décision. Donc par exemple sur le mildiou de l'oignon, on a un, une sonde, euh, qui va capter, c'est un modèle qui nous permet de, de, de calculer la sporulation de, de ce milieu. Donc, qui est basé sur la température, les l'hygronométrie, l'ensoleillement, le vent. Et à partir de ce modèle, on va pouvoir, on détermine quand euh, réellement c'est dangereux pour la plante de ne pas traiter. Voilà. Et pour pouvoir atteindre ce, ce milieu. Et euh, ensuite, il y a ça. Et on a parlé aussi du bulletin de santé du végétal, qui est aussi important pour nous pour essayer de voir comment on peut euh, agir euh, rapidement. Des pièges à pyrale. Donc, on a énormément de possibilités à faire ça. Mais euh, en matériel euh, proprement de, euh, de biocontrôle, on a très peu de choses euh, sur ces, pour ces maladies-là. Alors, 
rapidement l'impact sur, les, sur la, le cas du, de, 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 des fusariotes sur le blé. La fusariose est un champignon qui va se développer euh, sur, le, sur le blé, donc là c'est sur le blé dur, et euh, l'impact peut être euh, extrêmement important parce qu'il va générer des mycotoxines, et ensuite le blé sera invendable, parce que euh, impropre à la consommation. Donc comment, voilà, comment on peut agir là-dessus Ça c'est un peu ma question, ça joue sur le rendement et ça joue, joue également sur la germination. La production de semences, c'est quand même un critère important. Donc là, on voit qu'il y a quand même un delta euh, à peu près 15-20 quintaux euh, sur le rendement. Donc comment on peut jouer là-dessus Et on voit quand même qu y a, que le climat est très important. On a parlé de « on n'arrive pas à baisser les IFT » et tout ça, ce que vous présentez, Madame Jacquet, tout à l'heure. Mais euh, il faut prendre la composante du climat. Une année humide... C'est une année compliquée pour les agriculteurs parce qu'il y a une pression maladie qui est importante. Une année sèche, ça va être beaucoup plus simple. Certains, certaines fois, avec une bonne observation, on ne traite pas certaines céréales. Mais là, euh, voilà, année humide, on va être obligé pour tenir, voilà, toujours dans ce triptyque de développement durable, il y a un coin à tenir, c'est-à-dire de trouver réellement, le, voilà, de, de faire du rendement parce que c'est à la fois notre, euh, notre survie, quoi. Euh, comment je vois mon exploitation euh, dans 10 ans Donc, je pense que euh, cette approche-là doit être sur une approche variétale. Donc, l'approche de la diminution des fongicides, on doit trouver, euh, en, par la sélection, euh, par, euh, par le développement de nouvelles variétés, euh, des euh, possibilités d'avoir des variétés résistantes à, certaines, à certains fongicides, à certaines fongicides, à certaines maladies, pour réduire réellement les, les fongicides. Les innovations, bien sûr, mécaniques, donc ça, on y est déjà, mais il faudra réussir à avoir, euh, donc il y a des robots qui se, qui se mettent en place toujours par GPS, et essayer de bien viser, bien, euh, bien augmenter euh, ce, ce, ce travail mécanique. Euh, et ensuite, donc pour moi, les, les, les perspectives du biocontrôle, donc euh, il faut faire attention donc, aux solutions fongicides, Diminuer aussi les coûts à l'hectare, parce que, à un moment donné, s'il y a ces solutions-là, il faut réussir à, donc, à les, à les, à les développer le plus largement possible et qu'elles soient accessibles à, euh, à beaucoup de, beaucoup d'agriculteurs. Et ensuite, c'est une reconnaissance, donc, par la société de tout ce qu'on fait. On en a besoin et, euh, et on essaye de communiquer, de montrer ce qu'on fait. Et je pense que c'est, si on, on va dans cette période, cette, cette, cette part-là, c'est que l'agriculteur euh, a besoin aussi de reconnaissance euh, au niveau de, 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 la, de la société civile. Et euh, c'est par philosophie et par aussi pour montrer qu'on fait des choses et qu'on a envie, euh, envie d'avancer. Voilà, mais je vous remercie pour votre attention et je suis prêt à, à répondre à vos, à vos questions. I, I think uh, even if we are a little bit late, that we could we could catch 10 minutes for question from from, from you on, on on our farmers, how they feel, how they succeed, how they will fail, and, and and so on. I see one one lady here. Someone more. One lady here. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I have the 10 minutes, uh, as I understand. No, no, no. No, <laughs> uh, no I'm just joking. Like I'm joking. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, again, my name is Isabella Lang from I4MU, the organic farmers in Europe. And um, a lot of things that you said, I think, uh, perfectly enlightened what our farmers also telling me um, a lot. My questions to you three is uh, what do you feel about the availability of products in case you have to use biocontrol products? Is there for the pests and disease that appear also in the light of climate change? Do you feel that the toolbox you have or is enough? Um, maybe a bit of background why I'm asking these questions. You, uh, Alessandra, you mentioned um, Bacillus thuringiensis. I just came back from Germany. Um, 
as I already said today. Um, and I talked with organic wine growers in Germany. They use a product called Mycosine, which is a um, Bacillus thuringiensis based product. They, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is authorized for use in organic farming since the first regulation, since 1991. And this product has a long history of safe use. Nevertheless, it will not be reauthorized in Germany. Um, why? Simply because of economical reasons, because the reauthorization is too expensive. And uh, organic wine growers in Germany are very afraid to not have this product anymore. And we see some German regions where organic wine growers is decreasing, as so the number of wine growers is decreasing by 10 or even 15%. And this is clearly not in line with what we heard yesterday in the Green New Deal, that we want to increase organic farming. On the contrary, because of these small stupid reasons, organic farmers have to stop, which is a pity. And again, we also think that uh, we should go away generally uh, or lower inputs, but to have this transition, we still need uh, natural products. So um, we see there is a real big contradiction and it's really a threat to organic farming, but I would be interested how you see that, if you would agree or... Yes, thank you for your question. Sorry, sorry. Please. I would, I would ask Martin first. Sure. You want to collect uh, the questions? Yeah, 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 just because... Uh, Time. Uh, I think our translator are foreseen until, until one o'clock, and uh, I, perhaps we can beg to them five minutes, but I don't think we can but beg them more. Until one that it's one o'clock. Yeah, 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 no, okay, okay. no, just very fast question for me that's actually linked to what you said is is how how do you feel uh if what is happening on the Euro European level, especially vis a vis the agricultural policy, uh do you feel it if something which is more bringing you obstacles or making you this or are there concrete things that you would wanna continue or you would need? So what are the concrete asks, so to say, from the new cap? Merci de poser cette question. Euh, des actions concrètes dans la nouvelle cap, en fait, c'est de la recherche. On croit euh, dans, ces, dans le biocontrôle, on croit dans la réduction de, de, de produits phytosanitaires, on va y aller. Ça, c'est une certitude. Euh, ensuite, c'est que dans un système euh, de, de, de culture, euh, il faut euh, qu'on ait les outils pour remplacer ce qui existe euh, sur ces produits phytosanitaires. Remplacer l'existant par ben, des, des méthodes alternatives. Et c'est nous accompagner, nous aider euh, et, euh, nous, et euh, développer la recherche. Donc, on l'a vu, tant variétal que, euh, que sur le terrain, faire de la communication auprès des, des agriculteurs. Et, parce qu'il y a des choses qui marchent, mais essayer de faire une, un pool de tout ce qui fonctionne pour essayer à un moment donné, de, 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 de savoir ce qui, voilà, ce qui fonctionne et largement le diffuser. Voilà, ça, ça fonctionne, essayez-le. Ça, ça fonctionne, essayez-le. Et avoir un pas de temps de 4 à 5 ans pour pouvoir mettre ces, ces pratiques en place sans prendre de risque. Parce que le risque, euh, les, les, les cours en grande culture ne sont pas, 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 pas ce qu'ils sont et on ne peut pas se permettre de, prendre, de perdre une ou deux années de récolte. Donc c'est euh, réussir à, ne, à, à prendre, essayer donc, cette nouvelle pratique-là, tout en limitant le risque pour l'agriculteur. Alex Uh, thank you. Yes, to answer to a question, uh, the availability of products in UK um, at the moment is not uh, um, a problem. So we still have availability on Bacillus thuringiensis and uh, greater availability probably on Bacillus subtilis. And these are the two main uh, uh, biological control that uh, grapevine growers use. 
not just in an organic or biodynamic world, but in conventional uh, management too. I have to say, because of our climatic condition, the uh, moth threat is not as high as it is in Germany yet. Uh, it might become. So we've never been pushed into that direction where we need or require insecticide application in UK. Uh, but definitely the bigger issue for us are diseases. And uh, botrytis is one of the first, but uh, powdery and downy mildew are up there. And for an organic biodynamic grower, we do not have any tools within the biological control yet available to fight off these problems. We can only um, try to improve uh, the strength of the vines by agronomical practice, uh, by uh, using the plant extra that they can support the vine in particular deficiency and making a bean stronger than it has uh, inbred resistance as such. But definitely the future is to look into biocontrol for these two big problems. And this is where we need you guys to come on board. Um, there are studies done uh, on powdery mildew and Bacillus subtilis seems to have a little bit of effect on that. Even the use of trichoderma seems to have a little bit of effect on that. But um, we need something a bit more solid if we want to continue to improve the environment in which we grow grapevine. And um, so that's the call from you, really. Thank you. Sì, per quanto mi riguarda, io mi rifaccio un po' a quanto ha affermato il professor Martis dell'Università qui del Belgio, ovvero alla necessità fondamentale che l'agricoltore torni ad essere un agricoltore. Cosa vuol dire questo? Vuol dire che deve avere l'agronomia in mano. Con l'agronomia in mano l'agricoltore può mettere in campo tutte le strategie possibili per prevenire, per parare i colpi in anticipo rispetto a tutte le calamità che potranno derivare. Questo cosa significa? Significa che non sono importanti eh, le, gli strumenti per il controllo nel caso ci sia un, un, un problema? Assolutamente no, ma prima è assolutamente importante che l'agricoltore faccia tutto quello che è capace di fare, torni a fare tutto quello che un tempo era capace di fare per potersi difendere. È come se noi oggi ragionassimo di uscire eh, a, a, a petto nudo eh, nella, nella, qui nella piazza centrale e pretendessimo di non ammalarci, poi pretendessimo questa sera di avere una soluzione al mal di gola che eh, eh, ci viene. Capite da voi che prima bisogna fare un'azione preventiva e questo lo fanno gli agricoltori, bisogna lasciare che gli agricoltori decidano quali sono gli strumenti di cui hanno, hanno bisogno per poi poter fare tutti i ragionamenti successivi. Questo è il mio pensiero. Thank you, thank you very much. I think now we can, we can move to the political round table. And uh, Martin, I think you, your question on, on, on Europe, European policy, New Green Deal and, and CAP, I think is, is essential. Can I ask, please, our uh, honorable member of the parliament who are foreseen to participate in this round table to be here, to come here? I, I know that one, one of them will, uh, will I, I make a video and another one has make a statement. I propose the following. Uh, we, we will first give, give the floor to the, to the honorable member of the parliament who are receiving them in, us in, in, in the house, and I want, I want to thank them once again. After that, we will give the floor to the, to the commission, uh, and we, we are glad to have here the three, three legs, not of the sustainability, but of the, of the strategy, which is uh, agri, health, and environment. And after that, I will, I will ask my friend David to, to make some, some comment on, on what he has uh, listened from the, from the politicians and from the, the Commission. And, uh, well, uh, he has a well, well and, and, and solid uh, opinion on, 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 this, on this issue. Uh, I, Henriette, I think we are first to start with the video. 
No. No, let's start ah, okay, because okay. he has to run and yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bonjour. I. Vous êtes le premier donc à parler. Okay. No, 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 no. no. Oh. Okay. We have to be flexible. Uh, nous avons la chance d'avoir avec nous uh, Jean, je suppose. Jérémy, d'accord. Ok. Cinquième erreur de la journée. Uh, Jérémy de Serle, donc qui doit malheureusement nous quitter, donc on va lui donner la, la parole. Je, je vous demande uh, de, de ne pas être trop long pour qu'on ait uh, le temps de, de donner l'ensuite de la parole à la commissaire David et qu'on puisse terminer à temps pour nos interprètes. Je suis fils d'interprète et de délégué syndical, donc. Allons-y, Jérémy. Merci beaucoup, bonjour à toutes et à tous et merci de me donner la parole et merci aussi finalement pour cette, pour cette initiative, je ne serai pas très long je m'excuse déjà d'emblée je vais, je vais devoir vous quitter assez vite mais j'essayerai quand même d'écouter les, les quelques réactions après mon intervention ça me paraissait voilà, important de, de répondre à votre, à votre, à votre sollicitation sur les, les sujets autour de, de l'utilisation durable des, des pesticides c'est un sujet, c'est euh, un sujet qui importe beaucoup euh, aussi notre, notre société européenne. Juste peut-être pour me présenter poliment, donc euh, Jérémy de Serle, je suis député européen, certes, euh, mais je suis aussi agriculteur, euh, je suis producteur de viande dans le centre de la France. Voilà, et donc euh, j'ai été aussi président des jeunes agriculteurs, du syndicat des jeunes agriculteurs en France. Euh, donc euh, voilà, je ne suis pas tout à fait... Euh, Enfin, J'ai en tout cas un avis sur le sujet et je, je, ça m'intéresse aussi qu'on puisse aussi confronter nos idées. Et même si je suis pas arrivé au tout début de la réunion, j'ai euh, apprécié l'intervention euh, de mon collègue aussi agriculteur. Et donc, euh, voilà, je pense que sur ce sujet-là, nous devons essayer d'apaiser un petit peu euh, euh, la, la, la problématique et nous devons essayer d'amener de, le plus grand pragmatisme. Euh, C'est évident qu'il y a une demande et une attente sociétale très forte sur le sujet de la réduction de l'utilisation des pesticides, mais les agriculteurs ne sont pas sourds. Ils l'entendent et ils sont prêts à le faire. Sauf que, comme ça a été dit, ils le feront que s'il y a des moyens, que s'il y a des alternatives et que si on prend en compte aussi ce qui a déjà été fait en matière de réduction des pesticides. Si nous ne tenons pas compte de ce qui a été fait, nous ne pouvons pas demander aux agriculteurs de faire encore plus. Donc, euh, euh, soyons bien clairs aussi sur euh, euh, l'évolution voilà, qu'a que, que, qu pu connaître l'agriculture en matière de, euh, voilà, de techniques culturelles. Euh, ne doutons pas, ne sous-estimons sous pas pardon, ce que les gouvernements de divers pays ont mis aussi en place pour aller encore plus loin. Euh, voilà, soyons Soyons tous bien conscients de ça pour pas justement que le débat se cristallise et se, euh, où on victimise les agriculteurs, où on les montre du doigt, où on finalement où on compte pas vraiment sur eux pour, pour avancer. Donc voilà. Il faut, faut forcément mettre des objectifs euh, euh, chiffrés, bien évidemment. Il faut, faut forcément euh, euh, apporter aussi euh, des, 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 des choses qui, euh, euh, qui, 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 qui font changer l'utilisation le, 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 des, des, des pesticides. Mais euh, la première condition, ce qui marchera en premier, c'est si les agriculteurs, en changeant, en faisant évoluer leur modèle, gagnent leur vie. Demain, on n'aura plus besoin de demander aux agriculteurs de changer leurs pratiques s'il n'y en a plus. Donc, euh, et c'est quand même le risque. La démographie agricole, vous la connaissez tous aussi bien que moi, elle est catastrophique en Europe. Et si donc nous ne tenons pas compte de ce qu'on doit euh, donner aux agriculteurs et pour qu'ils puissent aussi répondre aux attentes sociétales, on, se, euh, on va un peu droit dans le mur. Donc je pense que l'Europe, justement, au travers de la politique agricole commune, au travers de son ambition euh, sur les écoschimes notamment, prouve qu'il y a des volontés d'avancer. Euh, ce qui a été Pardon, ce qui a été présenté hier par la, la présidente de la Commission européenne, le Green Deal, euh, c'est on ne peut plus 
clair dans les ambitions environnementales et écologiques que veut se donner, euh, donner l'Europe. Donc la réduction pesti des pesticides fait aussi partie du, du lot. Sauf que voilà, si on ne donne pas une dimension économique en parallèle de la dimension sociale qui est aussi souhaitée par, euh, par le plus grand nombre, eh ben on se, on se trompe. Donc j'insiste aussi moi sur le, euh, sur le besoin de cohérence des politiques publiques européennes euh, et aussi nationales en matière d'agriculture, de, d'environnement et aussi de commerce. Euh, on peut aussi sur ce sujet-là euh, lier notre action ou nos, nos propositions par rapport au commerce international et à, aux choix qu'on fait de ce, euh, sur ces sujets-là. Euh, ensuite, je pense... Euh, qu'il faut mettre des moyens, ça a été dit, d'accord, il ne me reste plus qu'une minute, je pense, ça a été dit tout à l'heure, mais qu'il faut mettre des moyens, pas colossaux, mais en tout cas adaptés aussi sur la recherche et l'innovation. Dans la prochaine politique agricole commune, si on si n'additionne on pas les dispositifs actuels à des dispositifs nouveaux en matière de recherche et d'innovation, eh bien on n'apportera pas les alternatives aux agriculteurs. Donc voilà, je pense qu'il faut avoir une approche euh, euh, un peu globale de tout ça, euh, en ne regardant pas non plus le sujet des, des pesticides, Isolément. Donc voilà, il faut réussir à le mettre aussi dans un, dans un pacte global euh, en croyant un peu plus aux agriculteurs. Voilà ce que je voulais dire. Merci, merci Jérémy. Merci pour votre courage qui, je sais, vous a déjà créé pas mal de problèmes euh, sur le terrain. Ça, mais ça fait partie du métier. D'accord. Merci. Uh, on, on, we, we have a video. We put the video. Yeah? Okay. Dear friends of Pan-Europe, colleagues, members of the European Parliament, and other distinguished guests, I apologize for not being able to join you in person during today's conference. At the same time, thank the organizers for letting me address you via video. I come from Slovenia, where the Save the Bees initiative was born as well as the proposal for the World Bee Day, which was successfully adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations two years ago and has already been celebrated for the second time in this year on the 20th May. The reason, I, the reason I'm starting with this is because I would like to point out that the importance of bees and other pollinators, which significantly depend on the state of biodiversity is of significant importance for the food production and food self-sufficiency. All the above mentioned achievements would not have been possible without good cooperation between beekeepers who are the initiator of these, in these initiatives, national and local authorities, and of course farmers who are the ones most dependent on the environment. Back home, I am an apple producer. My son is beekeeper and his bee hives are each year transported to my orchard during blooming of the trees. I know very well that my yields depend on bees and I know very well that I must respect bees and protect them. The importance of protecting pollinators and thus our biodiversity has never been so high on the policy agenda of the EU. Last year's EU-wide ban of most dangerous neonics to bees has been one of the important steps in that direction. New tools within the reform of the CAP, such as reinforced conditionality of the CAP and the eco schemes are some of the, of, of the tools to tackle these challenges. However, we have to remain realistic that the dependence of our agriculture to the plant protection products, either synthetic or biological, will remain, no matter how many restrictions and prohibitions we apply within the EU. That is, if we want to feed our citizens, of course. It gives us very little satisfaction prohibiting all PPPs within the, the EU while importing food from the 
third countries, production of which does not respect the high food production standards we already have in the EU. Instead of further, further prohibitions of all sorts of PPPs, which subsequently have impact on the research and development activities of the industry within the EU, I believe we should focus more on supporting technologies which enable, using, enable us using as little PPPs as possible while supporting breeding technologies which increase plant resistance to pests and diseases. Precision agriculture is the one that can make this possible, as it mostly help, helps reducing negative impacts of the use of fertilizers and PPPs on water, soil and air. Development of new farming machinery and utilities which help us identify pests and diseases are also very important. We also need better knowledge transfer to farmers in order to make agriculture more environmentally friendly. Supporting investments in that field within the CAP while at the, at the same time encourage, encouraging farmers to diversify their agriculture pr practices and support sufficiently within the CAP, as well as supporting farming practices in, in these disadvantages areas, would have the most positive impact on biodiversity while maintaining the production and yields that would allow farmers and nature to survive. Returning back to Slovenia, which is with 60% forests and 60% of all agricultural land constituted it from permanent pastures, one of the greenest EU member states, and because of that extremely popular with tourists from all around the world. It will remain like that if farmers will remain farming in harmony, harmony with nature as they did for centuries. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Uh, I think after, uh, uh, after him, who was, I think, from the Popular Party, I, we can give the, the floor to Sara from the Green One. And after that, I will, I will give again the floor to Michael, who has been there since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and you, will, you will have the end of the world in this, uh, in this political table before giving the floor to the Commission. Sara. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so let also introduce myself. I'm not just an, a new elected MEP. I'm also a chef. I have two restaurants. I'm a beekeeper. I have also a very huge organic farm in the east of Germany because the farms from the DDR was, were so huge. Uh, I have a slaughterhouse and a wooden oven bakery, an organic um, who bake bread like 100 years before with any, any substitutes. Um, we have also a butchery and I have a catering service. I started 35 years before to do film catering. So I think I am from farm to fork. Here mm -hmm. I'm sitting. Um, I have also a foundation, the hugest initiative in Germany who teach small children how to cook in schools and kindergartens because it starts also, we lose our handcraft, our identity, when we don't know what to do with the vegetable and the crops on the field, uh, how to use it when we can't cook. This is another theme. Um, I listen, I was at the conference from Farm to Fork, and I listened very much to the commission that said, we want to have uh, zero pollution and we have to reduce pesticides. And I was very happy to hear it so clearly from the commissioner of Agri, from Sante, from everybody. But now I, uh, I was aware a few days before to throw the, um, the, the targets out of the paper, how could that be that we, how co can, um, we cannot hope to reach a toxic-free future and uh, halt and reverse uh, the insect um, Armageddon when we don't have a plan how it's clearly also in the law how we can reduce it. And that's now that the, the target of, of um, 
to reduce this uh, pesticide reduction is <laughs> destroyed out, I, I have to really ask why? What's going on? Um, we cannot, uh, uh, Santi can, and also Adi can't, can't keep running scared of the lobby of a pesticide industry. He ruin our soil fertility, our health, and the health of our animals, and also of the water, and also of the climate crisis. If we don't are um, determined to fight against and find other proposals. So a lot of people said, yes, we have to do innovations and we have to wait that there's something is coming on. But if you hear uh, f uh, the one um, panel before, I would suggest there are still a lot of tools you can defend. My farm is 800 hectares, so it's not just a... Um, dreaming one hectare huge farm and I work myself to death. Uh, but also my farm is sustainable and acts like a small scale farmer in the diversity and with good old farming practice as we have about centuries and centuries. Let's say this crop rotation, if we do it as a scheme in the first pillar, and it has to be, it has be law that every good farmer has to do it, then we can have an immense uh, pesticide reduction. And also there are studies in France too, they said you can reduce uh, up to 50% of pesticides without any loss in the fields. So what we are discussing, it means we have still too much pesticides on the fields. We, we just can uh, skip the half and it will nothing change. Also, we have to be alarmed that there is, um, from flying insects, a reduction of 75%. Uh, but where? Not on the fields, on the protected areas, in the nature reserves because of the wind, because of the weather, of the rain. So in our protected areas in Germany, a loss of 75%. We wouldn't sit here if we know, wouldn't know everybody, every single person of you, we have really, really huge problems and we have to solve it. And we have to solve it now. We have these pesticides, um, uh, one minute left, <laughs> okay. <laughs> What I want to say is uh, we need really good farming practice. We need uh, scientists and advisor, independent advisor, not from the industry, who gives uh, from science to farm to science or from farm to science to farm. And we have to have a network from farmer to farmer to build a, a force for this uh, practice that use a lot of farmers, but a lot of farmers uh, don't know today how to farm and what they can do. We have to help uh, to be uh, to, to give the independence for the farmer um, today. I think this is the most important. And we need the diversity, not just on the plate, also on the field and also among the farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. We have the commission here. I'm sure they will, my ex-colleague will answer with detail to your question. Uh, Michael, yes, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me into this event. I would also like to introduce myself. I'm also freshly elected MEP, but for 20 years I've been in ecology. On the university, I was studying biodiversity aspects uh, in relation to land use, so I can, I'm right into into this topic, so to say. And I really enjoyed uh, this event today because we have seen a lot of. Uh, splendid presentations about different topics of, the, of uh, related to uh, the use of pesticides. So I will try to wrap it up a little bit from the political point of view, if, I, if I'm able to. Um, the, the general question is uh, whether we do need to fix or improve the situation we are currently uh, facing regarding to pesticides. And I, I'm convinced that the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we have seen that there is a rise in the use of pesticides, despite our ambitions to reduce the use of uh, pesticides. I'm quite sad that from the current form of the Green Deal, this statement about 50% of reducing of pesticides until 2030, or I don't know exactly the date, uh, was actually 
not involved in the in the in the final final version. But uh, nevertheless, we have to be really frankly that uh, we use pesticides because it's it's useful in agroecology. It's it's easy to use pesticides to have clean fields and to protect the crops. But there are these collaterals that are the, that are the problem, and these collaterals are quite quite strict. Uh, we really uh, uh, provide beside beside the positive effects of pesticides also health issues. We really face a catastrophic decline in biodiversity, and it's also because of use of pesticides. Not only, but also it's included in in, in the whole topic. Um, we have a really bad effect on soil and on groundwater, and uh, there are also the social aspects. People no longer are very very uh, large fans of of chemistry in the environment. They really uh, seek some some alternatives. They really like to eat fresh and healthy food. You know, we, we all know these aspects. So uh, inevitably, we have no choice than to find those those solutions, those alternatives. Uh, and from the political point of view, uh, I can state that there is this demand from public and from ecologists and from, from specialists and even from farmers to have this sustainable wave of, agri of uh, agriculture, which means uh, not so much chemistry involved, much more of the biology involved, much of, of the sustainability involved. But on the other hand, we see the political framework and I frankly have to say that I don't see this intent to really be coherent to really be effective, to seek for real solutions. Um, and we can go from CAP to Commission strategy to national strategies. For instance, in CAP, uh, if we know that the response for or, or the, the answer how to use less and less pesticides is to have more diverse ecosystems, okay, <laughs> I'll do my best. And we know that these diverse ecosystems are, are are working. Then the cap should simply respond to it and try to incentivize such systems. But what is capping do? It's much more uh, uh, going the other direction, and it's simply disadvantage disadvantages them. This can be seen in in regard with uh, agroforestry, for instance. There are very strict thresholds regarding the number of trees you can have on your field in order to get these direct payments. This has, has to be improved. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we can see, for instance, in accordance with Article 14 of the Sustainable Use of Pesticides Directive, that the general pr uh, principles of integrated pest measurement should have been implemented by all professionals users by 1st January 2014 and it simply didn't happen. The, these, these, uh, this improvement didn't deliver. And again, uh, I see a lot of greenwashing uh, within, within the strategy regarding uh, these aspects. For instance, in Slovakia, you can use within uh, the integrated production a pesticide called Mancozep, which is uh, fully authorized for the use in the Union. But in fact, this is a solution that is uh, consisting of two pesticides called Menep and Zinep which both of them are no longer authorized for the use. So this is exactly greenwashing, nothing else. And we are opposing against it. There are, there are these, there are these uh, objections within the parliament that I always uh, vote in favor uh, for, and uh, these are really addressing the ineffective process of reassessment of substances that are evidently, evidently uh, harmful for the environment, for human health. And uh, as man Martin mentioned, there is something like a purpose to, to have them on, on the market. Uh, so what I want to stress at the end, we need to be coherent, we need to be effective, and we have no more space for greenwashing. What we need are green solutions, and this is uh, valid for not only agriculture, but for all the aspects of our life today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and actually I'm going to be talking mostly on behalf of others. Um, but I just want to pick up on one thing that Michal mentioned, and that's uh, one of my top favorite topics, is policy coherence. And that's, I think, the very strong message to all the stakeholders, uh, because we have nice declarations and strategies, but then on the same hand, the same time, we do the exact, and we actually support financially exactly the opposite activities that are going uh, against what we're trying to achieve. And this is something which is really, really crucial issue to address. Uh, 
within the MFF, within the uh, new cap, uh, within the entire Green Deal, and I'm happy to that it's there, and this is something which we're going to be closely watching on how it's actually implemented. Uh, I would just say one point from my end, because there's uh, two other people I want to want to cover, and that's uh, in reaction to the uh, uh, research and development issue. Of course, we need research and development into integrated pest management and all the alternatives methods, because I believe that ultimately what we need to look at is not how to uh, provide uh, safer pesticides or safer synthetic chemicals for pest management. We need to look at how we do the pest management, and that is a functional replacement, not chemical by chemical replacement. Uh, and the second thing is we need to adjust our regulatory framework, especially regarding the testing, uh, because, yes, it's hard to provide, uh, hard to expect that the Bacillus thuringiensis will be able to be tested in the same way as you test an active ingredient and chemical. It's a very different approach that we need to take that actually recognizes these differences, doesn't lower the requirements, but kind of adopts to a different methods. But uh, the important people I want to mention is uh, two people had to apologize. One of them last moment to my colleague, Isabel Arcavas, sadly couldn't make it due to a family situation. Uh, so she sends her apologies. But uh, Jitte Gutenland uh, actually had to go to some COP. I heard it's in Madrid something. So I don't know if we still have time that I read her contributions because she asked me to to read it. At the same time, I'm a bit concerned we will not have time for the other stakeholders. Tough you can question. summarize? I, as I'll, I'll summarize. Or, okay. or at least a conclusion. Now, the, the, the summary is in a nutshell. Uh, we have uh, done some things, but sadly, on the overuse of pesticides, we haven't used, I haven't really moved since the 90s. Uh, and this is something which, in terms of the uh, levels of pesticide use, and something which is worrying. I'm not going to repeat the impact that we, that we all know in terms of the decline in insect uh, and uh, the endangerment of pollinators. I would, uh, uh, but uh, the and the knowledge is growing, so we really need to need to start acting. People have a right to live in a non-toxic environment, and that's some, something which is clearly uh, our job to deliver. With the with the green deal, uh, uh, Dita also expressed that this is something which is really big hope, uh, and we definitely. Uh, need to see to that that it's implemented and actually delivered and the pieces of legislation delivered in a way that uh, they bring change, not just empty words. And that's I'm trying to do it in a, in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. You have been fantastic. When I heard about coherency, I looked to my ex-colleague of the Commission. I don't know, Gil, you will take the floor or who will take the floor or you will take three of you the floor? I, I don't know. I, 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 I would uh... we need an inter-service so coordination yeah absolutely yeah. we are fully coherent and we talk to each other uh, which uh, means uh, that we have uh, one position which was adopted yesterday by, by the college so um, uh, all, all jokes aside I will introduce myself uh, Gijs Schilt as I work in DG Agri on, on policy perspective and now uh, I've been working a little bit on the on the farm to fork uh, thinking. Um, uh, very interesting to uh, be invited today. Uh, thank you for, for that. Uh, very, very timely. I'd like to congratulate the, the, the organizers on the, on, the, on the very timely uh, um, uh, moment of this, of this conference, because of course, in the, the Green Deal paper uh, that the college adopted yesterday, uh, pesticide uh, uh, reduction is one of the key, uh, one of the key uh, elements in the uh, sort of agricultural section uh, uh, of the of the paper, the agricultural and food section, the food systems section, I should say, because uh, the whole idea of uh, this green deal is that it's a holistic uh, uh, approach uh, on uh, achieving a sustainable uh, Europe, and this also goes for the for the food and agriculture sector. Um, so I think this is an excellent start, and um, and and. I, I think what we will do is we will try to each respond uh, from our particular 
angles of, of policy. So I'll talk a little bit about the common agricultural policy and then my colleagues from DG Sante and Environment will give their, uh, uh, shed their lights. I think that will be most useful for uh, you and for the uh, participants. So if, if you allow me, I would just like to say a few things on the common agricultural policy for which there is a reform on the table, as you know. Uh, it has already been discussed in the previous parliament, but now it's, it's on your plate. Um, and uh, the Green Deal uh, underlines that the, um, the ambition of, 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 of the Green Deal uh, needs to be reflected in the strategic plans that member states uh, are requested to draft under the proposals of the, of the Commission for the common agricultural policy in the next, uh, in the next period. So I think this is, this is a key uh, element because it links the common agricultural policy reform that's on the table with, with the Green Deal. Um, I think there are many elements in the Common Agriculture Policy Reform proposal that will be able to uh, drive the, 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 the change uh, that we need. Um, we are, for example, uh, proposing um, uh, a higher uh, baseline, and particularly for pesticides, links to uh, pesticide uh, legislation uh, under what is now called cross-compliance, so the links between direct subsidies and uh, EU legislation. So there we propose to include the Sustainable Use of Pesticide Directive. Uh, we propose a new um, a set of tools that are obligatory for member states to offer to farmers, but that are voluntary for farmers. So this is really an incentive approach um, in both the first and the second pillar of the policy. So both through direct payments and through rural development policy to encourage um, uh, higher environmental uh, outcome and this can also be used in particular for ensuring more sustainable use of pesticides uh, to uh, in fact reward farmers and incentivize farmers to use uh, uh, more sustainable uh, production methods integrated pest man management for example beyond the minimum set by the sustainable use uh, uh, directive um, and this um, uh, the, this incentive approach is not uh, just an incentive, it is linked to a whole uh, um, system that the uh, Commission uh, proposes to put in place, which requires member states to really work towards targets, to work towards uh, objectives, and these objectives are uh, laid down at EU level. Uh, three economic, uh, one of the earlier participants highlighted the economic aspect, the importance of the economic aspect. So indeed, sustainability under the cap reform is linked to both economic, environmental and social objectives. So member states need to create cap plans, plans on how to execute the, the common agricultural policy in their member states to focus on these objectives and to deliver on these objectives. So I think this is, this is uh, key. Just to pick up a few small points and then I'll pass the floor. Um, Mrs. Uh, Wiener highlighted uh, networking from farmer to farmer, and indeed this is, I think, key. Uh, we have a European uh, innovation partnership uh, where we are currently um, uh, supporting about 1,000 groups of farmers working together to implement uh, new technologies and different ways of farming, and, and this is something that uh, we need to continue, want to continue, and want to expand. So I think this is a key a key element, so I fully agree with you uh, on that. And also our um, farm advisory service that all member states ne need to have. Uh, 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 we also want more focus on this and require through the legislation member states to also focus on specifically environmental aspects within this advisory system. So we are trying to really uh, not only uh, go through uh, the, the subsidy system, so to say, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, reach out to farmers to to help them change practice, but also through innovation, uh, advice, and of course, and that will be my final point, through research and development. Uh, at part of the proposals for the multiannual financial framework for the next period is uh, a large uh, additional investment in uh, research and development, for which there is 10 billion for agriculture and the food system. And uh, this uh, budget will be extremely useful to uh, develop uh, not only um, uh, different um, uh, plant protection uh, systems, but also to uh, research and help develop uh, alternative or different farming models that, that you've also referenced today. I'll leave it at that. There's much more to say, but I think it's time to pass on to my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, thanks to the, uh, the organisers for, for the invite. I always find it very uh, interesting and challenging when we have farmers 
um, <laughs> along with policymakers, and that's something we need we need more of. I always find it very interesting to actually hear the the perspective and the the, the reality on the ground, because ultimately. Uh, decisions in the context of pesticide use and integrated pest management are not made by by us, by policymakers or by, by parliamentarians, but by the farmers on the ground. And as much as possible, we have to see how we can influence those uh, those decisions. Um, I, I think to try and encapsulate everything, uh, um, my understanding was we, we were talking here about what we've heard today means for, for policy or how it transfers to, to policy. I think for um, proper implementation of the Sustainable Use Directive, and in particular integrated pest management, um, we need a number of things. The first is we need a bigger toolbox. We need more um, alternatives um, using this hierarchy to work up from the, the, the ground upwards. And those would include new varieties, new seeds, um, biological pesticides, low-risk pesticides, uh, other production methods and precision agriculture. All those have been mentioned. I'm not making that up. Those have all been mentioned in the context of the presentations we've had so far. So clearly there, the link to policy is in, is, is in research and innovation to bring those to fruition. But we also need to consider then issues of, of approval. So there's issues regarding pesticide approval, but also issues, for example, regarding new breeding techniques in the context of seeds and varieties to see how, uh, how we can uh, enhance or speed up the bringing of, uh, uh, of new varieties to, to the market. Once we've got that toolbox, the farmer needs help, support in using those tools, in deciding at which stage they use the different tools that, that are at their, 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 their availability. And I think we heard very much from the French presentation uh, earlier, the, the important scene in the French approach to increase the DEFI demonstration farms uh, and the importance of those uh, in bringing things to, to, to the reality, to, to, to the farmer's mind. And from a policy point of view, the support of the, of the Farm Advisory Service, uh, which we've already heard about, is, is, is very important. We then need to talk about incentives because, as we heard from the presentations, uh, earlier, farmers are rather risk averse. Uh, we have to look at how the, we can incentivise farmers making uh, the correct choices. Uh, and here, the, present, the discussion and the presentation on the cap is clearly uh, crucial to that. But we, we need to go also beyond money to also consider moral decisions um, and the other decisions that are made by farmers, not just on the basis of, of money, but on what they see is right. And here, Again, the farm advisory service and the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, work is very important because if a farmer sees that other people are doing it and it, and it, and it works, uh, not just from a financial point of view, they, they, they will do it. And I'd like to add one element that I think has missed out from the discussion so far co completely here, uh, which is the role of member states in official control. One of the things that's escaped the discussion so far is that next week the official control regulation comes into force. And for the first time, the Sustainable Use Directive is part of that regulation, um, which means that member states have an obligation to consider issues of the Sustainable Use Directive, with the exception of pesticide application equipment, but all other aspects of the Sustainable Use Directive in their systems of official control, so in their inspections, their reports to the Commission, and so on and so forth. And I think we also need to change your mentality a little bit from promoting um, integrated pest management and the tools that we've talked about, which is good, but to also talk about it in the context of it being a legal obligation and something that Member States should ensure is carried out. I think the other issue is, is I probably should mention as well, um, targets, but I'll, 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 if you want me to mention targets, I will, but I'll you want me to stop, I think, because I've run out of time. So. Thank you for, for your saying. Uh, it sounds really good for me, but I have one question. Is, will there be any financial consequences in the first pillar, in the uh, in thinking of subvention, if they don't follow strictly the reduction or the uh, zero pollution? Will there be really any consequence for every farmer uh, financial, or is it just 
you could or we give it in the second pillar or something or will there be really make a difference because you know 2009 you made a lot of good efforts and uh, <coughs> nobody followed you and there was no controlling at all and now we have the disaster it's maybe for high to, to answer <laughs> no Do you want to yep. answer? first pillar sorry so i get all the difficult questions which is good uh, um, <laughs> Well, let me first say that uh, in, in uh, the previous CAP reform, we proposed to make uh, the Sustainable Use Directive part of uh, a conditionality of cross-compliance. This didn't work. Now it's on the table again, so I hope that works this time. That would be uh, a way of linking pesticide use and sustainable practices to, um, to uh, support in the first pillar. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the first part of the answer. I think you, your thinking is going beyond that. Uh, thinking how can you uh, uh, link uh, a, a reduction target to uh, payments to individuals in the first pillar. Um, I, I would find that difficult to, to imagine. Uh, clearly this is something to... Uh, uh, it's early days. I mean, we have uh, uh, now the uh, paper on the table. I think what the if, if, we, if I look at the way the common agricultural policy reform is now uh, constructed, it's based on, uh, on objectives, and linked to that there are indicators, uh, impact indicators. One is on particularly on uh, uh, measuring use and risk of pesticides. So <clears throat> in my uh, thinking, if you want to link uh, a European-wide target uh, on pesticides, uh, and let's first wait if such a target will be set. I mean, uh, uh, but, but if you could imagine that, then of course this you would link this to what member states need to do in their plans. I mean, that is how the logic of the common agricultural policy reform that is now on the table would work. So you would, you would, as a, uh, uh, you would require member states, and that's, that's in a way what the, uh, what the Green Deal paper says. We want member state plans to reflect the ambition level of the Green Deal. So that's, that's how I think uh, EU-level ambition should work through to uh, the cap on the ground in the member states, through these strategic plans. I'm playing a terrible role, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and Andreas, uh, two minutes perhaps, after that David, and after that I have to give the floor to, to another, uh, another David who, who makes the conclusion. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. I will try to be very quick. I prepared some slides, but uh, in, for the sake of time, uh, maybe I'll uh, skip those. Um, maybe they can still be distributed because I think they, they will underline a bit the, the, the sense of urgency that, that is, is here. I mean, we are used to use, uh, see pesticides being used in agriculture since decades, and that uh, takes a, a bit away uh, um, the, uh, the view on, on what is actually happening on the ground in terms of biodiversity loss. So we have a dramatic reduction of, uh, of bird population. 60% of, of birds have been lost since the 80s. So what is basically left is our birds, which are no longer uh, very strongly dependent on insects, on their, on their prey. Um, and uh, so the only ones who should be happy about that are the, the insects, because the insects and birds are in a predator-prey relation. And if we, what we would expect by all this bird decline is that, of course, that the insect population should explode. But what we see is the contrary. We have seen a loss of 80% of insect biomass over a few decades, um, and that is, uh, this is absolutely dramatic, and we are very close to reaching zero. So I think people who uh, remember how the windscreen of uh, cars looked after go, uh, driving uh, on, a, on a summer day uh, in, to vacations, and you had to stop several times to clean the window, these times are gone. And they are largely gone because we are continuing uh, to use very large amounts of pesticides. Strangely, these effects, which are quite dramatic, and there are good studies, and if you have the time to look at the slides uh, later on, there, there, is, there is a good study showing that this trend was quite dramatic uh, across German um, uh, nature reserves over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, this trend is not picked up by any, uh, um, any dramatic increase in pesticide use. So we are, so we are, we are seeing uh, our indicators are not showing the, the reality, what's happening there. So what we s certainly hope is, of course, that the future agriculture policy will be very important and instrumental. But 
it, we cannot expect the policy in itself to establish a reduction of pesticide use. So the, there is a need for a dedicated policy on, 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 on pesticide use, risk and use, because it's, it's very clear that just a change in the cocktail, in the, in the, in the substance classes, um, it, we will not achieve the needed reduction in the number of treatments and in the area treated that is absolutely essential to, to halt this decline of biodiversity. So therefore, there is a need for targets at some stage. The Commission will certainly come forward with, with a policy um, as announced in the new Green Deal. We'll see what will be in it. In it um, and, uh, but just one plea, of course, is... Uh, crop rotation is absolutely essential, it's an absolutely key fundamental principle, and we certainly hope very strongly that this will be a, a maintained as an element in conditionality. It should be absolutely fundamentally required from all uh, farmers to be practiced. Um, and, but unfortunately, we see currently a trend in the Council that this uh, would be taken out of the, of the basic uh, requirements. Um, so we're here now in the Parliament, and there are a lot of people who can do something about that. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, David, we, we start. Uh, th thank you. It's nice to have you back in a, in a European meeting. Um, uh, very quickly, um, I think there are a number of things that need to happen. First, I have to agree with Andreas, we need a, a, a dedicated uh, pesticide policy. It can't all be done through incentives, and the CAP is an in incentive delivery policy, and um, there's quite a lot that can be done. So. Uh, so we need that, we need targets, and there may need to be some sophistication in the targets. And we need a lot of capacity building and, and research. Um, now, in doing all this in a coherent approach, that means looking at the registration process. We haven't got time to talk about that as part of, of a joined up policy. Um, uh, looking at the advisory systems, uh, looking at the, the way the market works, and uh, Eric has gone, um, uh, it's harder for the EU to develop markets than it is to, to regulate, but there's still some things that can be done, uh, and, and so that, that's an area I think we'd like to hear more about. Um, but my main theme here is the, the member states essentially have got used to a very low level of delivery on the SUD. They expect to do nothing, they've got away with doing nothing, and this has to stop. <laughs> no, that's the number one thing. And so MEPs, I mean, I'm sure you're aware, in the Council right now, as Andreas has just said, there's been an attempt to water down eco-conditionality in the CAP and at the same time increase the budget. Well, this is not really OK from an uh, uh, environmental public goods point of view. It, it's essential that MEPs have a positive role in this. They're looking at, at the dynamics of this policy, understanding um, uh, where things are not going right, and then also avoiding what happened with the greening, which was a disaster in the sense that the parliamentarians allowed member states to do almost anything under the umbrella of greening, and some good things happened, but a lot of money was wasted on uh, measures which uh, had been allowed under an enormous menu. You, you cannot have this happening before again. So the message in the next CAP, I think, needs to be much more um, that we're going to use this performance-based approach in a new way. The member states will be held to account, and they, they need to be given clear expectations in their in their SWOTs, in their assessments, in their proposals, that they are going to have to deliver uh, on, on this agenda. Because right now, I don't think they have that impression. <laughs> they, they, they're not uh, there at that point. And that means um, investing money, not necessarily just EU CAP money, because most member states want to, to, to take the money and give it all out on the farm. They don't necessarily want to spend the money on the capacity building, on the, on the research, on, on building up the advisory systems. They're going to have to have a very strong message that this isn't good enough, that there will have to be that capacity building. Then, uh, the, it, it, as part of that, we need to see this menu of measures, uh, and, and Heiss has mentioned some of them. A, a lot of incentives could be given um, to innovation. I think one that hasn't been mentioned is risk management. In, in Italy, for example, there has been 
some attempts to help farmers by paying for risk management for five years. I think you mentioned this in France. Um, that's a tool we need more of. There needs to be a clear understanding that uh, pesticide reduction has to be across the board. It has to be um, helpful to um, biodiversity and water targets. And therefore, it's not only in the indoor and um, uh, controlled environments where we can make progress, which is great. It's got to be in the arable crops. It's got to be, and exactly as you were explaining in France, this is where it's difficult. Um, so, um, how do we get member states to, um, to develop good programmes? Because the danger with a performance-based approach, one minute, in, in the cap, is that the, the Commission has to agree everything in about 10 weeks. This is a huge one. So we need a process from now to here, so that when you arrive and you're assessing member state programmes, they, David, good. if you speak out of the yeah. micro. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're already good. That, that means we need to have guidance, workshops, events like this where member states know what's going to need to be in their programmes. Otherwise, they're not going to be compatible with farm to hawk. They're not going to be compatible with the, toxic, with, the, with the chemical strategy. They're not going to be compatible with the biodiversity. So we need to start now to go on that pathway so that those strategic plans are actually delivering something real. We, we don't need to wait for the Commission papers. Thank you. OK, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm very friendly. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to ignore political. Look, just a very quick question, because Mr. Owen Griffiths was cut, was cut off, I think, uh, just before he was getting on to the question of targets and indicators. Um, can I, could I please ask the official from DG Sante, can you guarantee that in the Farm to Fork strategy or in any part of the Green Deal, we will have um, clear numbers, clear uh, reduction targets or some sort of risk indicator target for reducing the amount of pesticides? Please answer yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what I can say is that the issue... I can't answer yes or no. Well, the, the issue of targets for pesticides has is, is, is not, is not gone away and won't, won't go away. Uh, I think our Commissioner tweeted already this week that it's the intention to agree ambitious targets on pesticide risk reduction. Uh, the issue with the not announcements in the Green Deal is we, we simply aren't at the the stage yet to announce what the target will be, whether it's something that's achievable. And if you set targets, you have to have something that you can measure. Um, and there's a, a discussion that we could have for, for the next two days over what measurement you have in setting targets for, for pesticides. Because if you set what's easy to measure, the volume, you may well be counterproductive. Because if you use neonicotinoids, you use less volume than you do if you use the alternatives. So. It's not an easy uh, area. It's not the intention of the Commission to walk away from this. It's something we all need to talk about before we reach a conclusion. Um, and I'm sure more will be in the farm to fork, or we are already discussing legislative proposals um, in, the, in the coming years in the context of the Green Deal on farm to fork uh, that would include any targets if they are agreed. Thanks, we'll be watching. OK. Uh, David, you were foreseen for half an hour. After that, we, 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 need, we negotiate 15 minutes. Now I can beg you 10 Bye. minutes, please, just in order to, to, to save our, our interpreters and, and so on. Just before giving you the floor, because I don't know if at the end we will have time, just to thank them for, for, their, for their support. Thanks. Uh, uh, Renew Europe and Martin for, for their, their invitation and, and the honorable member of the parliament to be there uh, animating the, the, the discussion. Thanks to you to be there. Thanks to Pan Europe, obviously, and to EOBC and IBMA for, for this event. Thanks to Paul, who has been organizing and taking care of everything. And, well, and thanks for, for, to you to be there, because if not, it will be really sad to have this event. Now you can conclude 10 minutes and... Uh... Thanks, Thomas, and I will uh, stick within that time. So there will be some expanded conclusions in the uh, publication when that comes onto the web of both IBMA and uh, Pan-Europe. So let me start with the ambitious uh, plans by the Commission. 
that we're looking at climate change, we're looking at the environment, sustainability, and so forth. It's to be commended that that's there. However, though it's welcome, and it's come up in this meeting, and it's come up in the press as well, that that needs to be expanded on. We need those quantitative elements there. It was described in today's media as a bit fuzzy, and fuzzy is not good enough. We've got to deliver more than that. We need those targets, and we can't backtrack. The uh, new Green Deal, it's of tremendous value to society at large and farmers as a special particular group. However, we're seeing those worrying signs of emissions. We're seeing the targets dropping out and so on. They've got to be put back in there. We've got to ensure that we have something to measure with. It's not easy, but we have to do it because we haven't got that option uh, not to do that. I asked the Commission to look at what we've got as the title of this event, that we're looking at the use reduction and reference to alternatives and removal of dependence on chemical plant protection products. I then asked the Commission to give details of how they intend to deliver that with those ambitious targets and go forward and link them, because they do need to be linked. And that linking needs to have consequences. And it's not uh, nice always to have those, but that needs to happen to make those things work. So with that, a couple of particular points that the uh, two sponsors have asked for, that IBMA have very much asked for the fact that while we are looking at a new regulation, while we're awaiting that, that has been sort of put in uh, a very soundly backed resolution by this parliament, that we need to have the adapted data requirements, not only for microbials, but for natural substances and semiochemicals. Uh, we heard Martin tell us that we need to have robust evaluation of those inputs uh, so that we have confidence there. But it does not need to be the same as the evaluation of uh, traditional chemical plant protection products. So as we go forward, we need to be looking at that. And we need to include those in the farm to fork strategy as we go forward. Pan have been very adamant that we need to mirror their targets when we're looking at uh, pesticide use reduction. We need to have those targets in there, but they need to be ambitious. We need to be looking at achieving those. And if we're not achieving those, why are we not achieving those and incorporating those in there? So with those particular areas that the two uh, organisations are looking forward to, I say that over these past seven symposiums, because this is the seventh one, we've moved farmers to the forefront and they need to stay there at the centre of whatever we're doing. In the future, that needs to happen. And I say to the MEPs that the change we are looking for has to be a new, holistic, sustainable farming system that it's difficult. Yes, and the social scientists have talked to us today a bit about why that is difficult. But it is achievable, and we need to be doing that. And the uh, input of the social scientists is most welcome and needed, and I want them to continue in this debate as we go forward. But policy makers have to listen to the pressure that they're receiving and the strong evidence of the biodiversity loss. That's been talked about, that we're looking at a big reduction in the bird species, we're looking at a big reduction in the insect biomass. We're also looking at other reductions. It's serious. We need to 
enable this big paradigm shift that we're looking for. And while we're there, the uh, MEPs have to ensure that that innovation is encouraged, that SMEs are protected and facilitated, that societal voices are heard and enacted on, that farmers are encouraged to uh, change and given the tools and the knowledge and support that they need to make that change. It's not an easy task and it never will be, but the true, truly worthwhile uh, challenges really are never easy and that's what we've got to look forward to from our MEPs. And it's encouraging to see that that triangle is becoming mainstream and that it is recognised as a tool. So I say to you all, be and continue to be part of this ongoing change because it is something that's happening now and there are encouraging signs, but we can't just leave it that way. We have to put some facts and figures behind it and we have to make that work across all sectors and keep the farmers at the centre. So thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Uh, I think the presentation will be available in the, in the web page, this means uh, because I have been interesting. Again, thanks to the interpreters. I've been three minutes. Uh, more thanks for, for your flexibility. Thank you and see you well next year for the next event. Yes, and some refreshments. Ah, ah, oh, there, there, okay. <laughs> there is, after feed for food, there is food for feed. Well, there is, or for thinking, well, there is some food here available. Please enjoy it. Many thanks to everyone. Thanks to the deputy. Thanks to the commission. Thanks to you.